Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back for another edition, a special edition of Jim Cornette's drive through right here on a beautiful Tuesday this week, as opposed to our usual Monday release schedule. I am the great Brian Last, your host, the host with the most, and of course, the star of the show, the man who typically would answer your questions, but this week we'll be reviewing a couple of big wrestling events and Who knows? We'll see how much time we have. Maybe we'll get a question or two. But the man on the line for you right now, Mr. Jim Cornette. Yeah, so's your old man. What's your problem? Oh, for heaven. What's you know very well what my problem great Brian Last, host with the most, meet the beast with the least, right here. (laughs) I my head is spinning. My brains have been turned into jelly. I'm rubbing my face. I'm rubbing my face now. And I feel like I've I've been drugged. I'm on some drugs. I've been slipped a Mickey Finn. My whole brain feels like a slinky. I don't know. <laughs> this is a lot of modern wrestling to watch in one weekend. I'll say that. And if you asked me off the top of my ass what I actually watched without referring to my notes, Pat McAfee and Adam Cole, and I can't remember the rest of it right now off the top of my ass, but we'll, we'll go through it in detail. But hold And then as you usually do before we went on the air here, before we, we started this program, you, you start telling me how many fucking million people are listening to these things and that oh this is a record and that's a record and i'm like i i got nothing to talk about except shit that makes me want to saw my fucking carotid artery with a rusty fucking bread knife how can how can we be entertained but you know what but there's the thing that there's a bigger audience now to hear people talk about how bad wrestling is than there is for wrestling there was some good stuff too. There was a few things. They were on both shows. There, on both there a- was some fine people on both sides. AEW had some good stuff. Takeover had some good stuff. There's bad stuff. There's lots and lots of bad stuff, but there was some good stuff too. <laughs> you, they should just do more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. That's a fairly simplistic formula, but it usually works because then at the end of it, you get more of the good stuff and and less of the bad stuff. The best way to do that is have every wrestling show go to one hour, but that will never happen. Oh, good God. You know, I enjoyed an hour and a half of AEW this week uh, because that's all that aired on my DVR uh, since the basketball game went uh, half an hour over. Now I remember why I hated being on the Turner networks, <laughs> especially in, in the, in the, uh, baseball season. And I know you're a baseball fan. I, I'm sure that there's something to be said for it. I just don't know what there is right now, but those goddamn games would go so long in the Atlanta Braves and they'd be standing there and everybody'd be scratching their nuts and spitting on the ground and, and flipping their cap and looking at each other and for 15 minutes before they goddamn made a move. And I'd be, I'd, bring the program on. I'm on the open. I am a big baseball fan. I have always hated the Braves, but that's another story. I'm a Met fan as part of the reason why. But it used to drive me crazy, even as a baseball fan, tuning in to watch TBS Wrestling. And there's Dale Murphy. And I just, I don't need to see the Braves right now. I remember, as a matter of fact, before we go into these reviews this week, here as a preface, the one of the first things I learned about wrestling from Christine Jarrett was it hurts you when they switch your TV time or when you switch your regular day of your house show. In other words, Louisville was Tuesday nights. So when they couldn't get the gardens and the, the circus or whatever, and they had to go to another night that was going to hurt and they tried to plug it, you know, a few weeks in advance and et cetera, but still it hurt because wrestling fans, she would say are creatures of habit. And even more when your TV was fucked up, it would hurt because the TV was at the same time. Obviously more people watched the TV than came to the arenas. So if the TV was the same time, at least they knew you had changed your night at the, at the arena. 
but in some of the big cities, that's, uh, you know, that came, that was par for the course that the TV stations would bump you around a lot, but generally, uh, you know, in the Carolinas here in this, especially in Memphis, but in this territory, Louisiana, they did, you know, the places that had really high viewership, they wouldn't fuck the TV around too much. And they were usually on independent stations, but one day here in Louisville, it was in 1976 and I tuned in 15 minutes ahead of time to then it was on channel 41 WDRB as before we moved to wave and 15 minutes early to, you know, make sure I'm sitting down and ready for wrestling snow. What the fuck snow? The goddamn station is off the air. Found out later on lightning had hit the transmitter and knocked the whole goddamn station off the air. Do people know now, do some of the people know what I mean by snow and the station being off the air? I just thought of this. Older fans would, younger fans. I mean, younger fans may not even really watch TV much. It may all be on YouTube. Well, don't just completely piss on everything. Make me in a bad mood, even worse. But but no, younger fans out there. When you were watching television, not on cable, when it actually had to be beamed to your antenna, it was a signal through the air from a transmitter. And when they went off the air and were not broadcasting, you got a white static, static sound and white screen of snow, nothing on. And I'm what the fuck? How it's, it's a uh, goddamn 1145 uh, on Saturday morning. How can channel 41 be off the air? And so I sit there. And I'll have you see, this is where you know where you're down to your base audience. You're down to the people that are going to come no matter what. When you change nights at the, uh, at the building of your weekly or monthly house show, it's going to drop, but you're going to get your, you know, your real regulars, your real devoted fans. And even more when the TV changes, you're going to get your real devoted fans. You're not going to get the average folks. I sat there and watched snow for an hour and 15 minutes, because if it does come back on, they're going to be in the middle of the show. I don't want to miss anything. That's how it never did. It didn't come back. I think it was off for a fucking day. It was a big goddamn hoopty doo here. But anyway, that Tuesday night, nobody knew why out of the blue, because they had done an angle on TV. What it was to this day, I don't know. Uh, but the main event was Don and Al Green back together about three or four years after their last big main event run against Tojo Yamamoto and Jerry Jarrett. Their classic rivals. And I'm like, how the fuck did we get this main event? And they knew we didn't see the TV, right? So it was a grudge match we were supposed to know. And they they basically jumped, just jump-started it and did a wild four-way fucking brawl tag match as a whole fucking match was an angle. Quadruple juice, double sets of heat, big fucking comeback, got juice on Thomas Marlin, the referee, in the end of it. And shot their own angle because they knew the whole city of Louisville hadn't seen the fucking TV angle. And they drew off of that for uh, several weeks. It was one of the better matches I've ever seen live. Crazy chaos. But anyway, things can happen when you change your TV time. And especially when I have to watch all of it the same weekend. You know, not exactly snow, but when I was a kid, when I first got really into wrestling, when I was nine years old, my father eventually ended up buying every pay-per-view I wanted to see, and they were pretty regular. I mean, he was a boxing pay-per-view guy. He had no idea what he was in for with me and wrestling. <laughs> but the first few pay-per-views I wanted, he just didn't see the value in it. He's like, you know, this is a fad. You're not going to be into it. It's a passing fad. So he didn't get me WrestleMania V or Great American Bash 89, which was right when I got into the NWA, like right before the bash. But I went to the pay-per-view channel, and you could listen to the commentary. I, I know what you did. And you could see a scrambled picture. So I you sat there. the scrambled feed. I listened to the scrambled feed, and I played with my G.I. Joe Wrestling Federation. <laughs> but that's another thing people don't experience anymore, is the idea of a scrambled pay-per-view feed. That was, I get the early technology, they couldn't just flip things on and off in the twinkling of an eye, but somehow they could scramble the signal unless you paid for it. Because I, you know, had, had uh, experienced the same thing, except by the time pay-per-view came along, I was buying them to, because I was on a lot of them, but I didn't ever buy anything that I wasn't on, I, but I did occasionally listen. So wait, and, hold on, so hold on, you were sitting there while you were in the NWA with like a WWF pay-per-view on and you wouldn't buy it, but you would listen to it? 
Um, every couple, every when it, whenever I was around and there was any type of wrestling pay per view on, I would fucking click it on there and see what the fuck they were saying. I wouldn't sit there fanatically for three hours, but I would see what the fuck was going on and get a flavor of it. See, it worked with Ventura and Monsoon. They were the perfect combination to pull that off. Where you don't really need to see. Yeah, <laughs> you don't need to watch. You just need to listen to Jesse yell and scream. Well, besides that, some of those matches during that fucking era <laughs> were better heard than seen anyway. That's true. Um, before we get into all the big reviews, I have got one email that I had to read because it tickled me. It actually, it's a good question anyway, but it, it tickled me because of one letter was, there's a misprint. Uh, but it is from Eric from Cumberland, Rhode Island. And he writes, Dear Jim, recently I came across a YouTube video of the fastest professional wrestlers it showed the mcguire twins happy humphrey and haystacks calhoun in action <laughs> the fastest <laughs> that should have been two t's in there uh eric the fattest that's what he meant to say the fattest professional wrestlers oh it showed the mcguire twins happy humphrey and haystacks calhoun in action and all three or all four were more entertaining and intriguing to me than all of today's garbage wrestlers. Any cool stories about these guys would be appreciated. And I like that they were indeed some of the fastest professional wrestlers. Uh, we mentioned Haystacks Calhoun here a week or two ago, and I popped you because I was, yes, I actually did meet and see Haystacks Calhoun live in action, but I never met Happy Humphrey, obviously. Um. It, it, do do the people today, do the people today, Mean Gene, do they even know who the McGuire twins were? Uh, or are we? do we have to start this from the ground up? Where's our audience on this, Great Brian Last? Well, two things. One is I don't know how entertaining the McGuire twins were. Well, but secondly, people may not know them by name, but the image of the two overweight twins on motorcycles, I think, is still known. Okay, well there you go. There you go. They even they do it on Family Guy and The Simpsons. They, the two identical seven hundred pound twins on motorcycles were Benny and Billy McGuire. And it, this wasn't new to wrestling. Uh, it started in the in the thirties and really blossomed in the forties. Uh, the the freak show guys, and that's a, a politically incorrect term, but I mean, when I was a kid, you went to the state fair. They still had the you know, the sideshow and the, and the freak show where they had the world's fattest man or fattest woman and the world's smallest or, you know, the, the bearded woman or Jojo, the dog face boy or Zippy, the pinhead or whatever, you know, right next to the fucking cow with five legs. You, and you paid 50 cents and went in and saw then the fat man would talk to you and scare the little kitties. Yeah. Jack Pfeffer had blimp Levy. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Martin, the blimp Levy, who, I actually have a poster from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, the Coliseum there in, in 1946, I believe. Uh, the blimp versus the the angel. Because, oh, wow. Wow. It, well, that was a big drawn match in the 40s. Think about this. Um, in the wrestling business, a lot of the guys went in service. And, you know, uh, uh, Longson, I guess, was past the age at that point. He was the world champion. He's the biggest gate attraction in wrestling, but he's actually one of the very few in the World War II years, one of the very few gate attractions. And that's when Pfeffer had gotten the the, the blimp and then he, the, the angel, the original angel, uh, the French angel. And, and, you know, the freak show guys, they, they were, they either, they were too old. They couldn't pass physical. They were foreign citizens. They weren't in the army, right? And they pushed that a lot. And also because it's hot shotting to do a freak show match. It's the same thing in MMA. They've done it in, you know, the past 20 years with the seven foot giant or the guy with, you know, pituitary gland issue against, you know, and, and Manny Yarborough in the first UFC pay-per-view was 600 pounds, right? So anyway, it started there and, and it did well in the, in the war years. And then they kind of got entrenched. That was part of what, you know, what you saw with the wrestling crew was you got the, you got the wrestlers, you got the baby face, the heels, the Cowboys, the Indians, all the different gimmicks. You got the giants and the freaks and, and, and the midgets and the girls, you know, uh, bring, 
<laughs> as the old poster went, bring the midgets. The kids are wrestling tonight, right? So anyway, um, Happy Humphrey, what, what did he start? Probably early 50s. Um, his name was William J. Cobb. He was from Macon, Georgia. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records, at, or he was at one time up and through the early 70s at least. He was on record as the world's heaviest man in history. He got up to 802 pounds, coincidentally, the same weight that Yokozuna was at when they wouldn't license him anymore in New York in 96. Um, and they... Go ahead. I was going to say, have you seen the pictures of him when he first started? Because he was nowhere near that big when he first started. No, well, it, it, look, look at all the big guys. They they always gain weight throughout their careers. Haystacks Calhoun, they always build him at 601 pounds from Morgan Corners, Arkansas. I, he probably never was 600 ever, but he was bigger when he was almost ready to retire than he was when he was a, a young man. But the, the Maguires really, when they started wrestling, they were billed at 660 and 640. And that probably was close, if not slight exaggeration, but they were in the Guinness Book of World Records too for World's Heaviest Twins. And did that? they got up to mid-700s before, and I never remember which, Either Benny or Billy had the weight loss surgery. Which one was it? Do you know? I don't know. Um, but one had weight loss surgery and one died very young. Um, and so they, they, you know, but they gained in their wrestling career, which lasted less than 10 years or probably maybe 10 years max. They gained 150 pounds a piece. Anyway, happy Humphrey. Uh, he was the guy in the, in the, in the fifties. And of course he was being booked out of the central States, I guess, Gus Karras, a Kansas city promoter. And he put the local kid with him to drive him around. Cause happy Humphrey couldn't fucking drive. He was too fat to reach the steering wheel. And that's how Harley race. That was his first major job in the wrestling business. And cause Humphrey couldn't get into a lot of the showers. They said Harley would have to take a fucking garden hose and take him out in the parking lot and hose him off. But he was he was just a guy that I've seen some film clips. He was just a guy that was like a he was like a giant Ronnie Gossett. Ronnie was like a human waterbed. He had no weight to him. He was just huge. He was it was all I'm not even knocking Ronnie Gossett. I loved Ronnie Gossett. He was a funny fucker, but he was just all flab and no muscle. And Happy Humphrey, I think, was the same thing because a guy that size with all those, you know, the various fat rolls and everything, uh, you know, anyway, um, then Haystacks Calhoun came along, late 50s, got over real good with Vince Sr. and in the Northeast. And so he was the big guy wrestler for all of the 60s. He was the name um, and the early 70s. And they tried, uh, they found the kid in, um, uh, oh God, in Louisiana, T. John Thibodeau, that was, had to be 700 pounds. And he was just a big, huge fucking human waterbed too. And a man mountain Mike, right. Was probably about the same size as Haystacks. He was the West coast Haystacks Calhoun. They used him on top out there. Maybe it was, it was, they had to fly him across the country freight. That might've been a, a trans might've been an issue. And then the McGuire's came along and did the twin thing. And I'm, I actually met Billy and Benny and talked to them a couple different times and saw them live several times. And they were just the nicest country boys from, I think, Hendersonville, North Carolina. And just had voices like, and just talked like that. And they were just, they were nice. And they just, they were made wrestlers because of their size. And it was an attraction. And they never worked a territory. It was even more like Andre's schedule that you didn't, you didn't get a good match out of them. You, you booked them to come in against a, like a heel team that had a lot of heat because that way they, but they were bumping heels. So the heels could bump off of them. And, and you never, you know, it was just to embarrass the heels and, or to see these guys in a, a match on the card against some underneath heels, just to see them and pay to see them maybe once every couple of years, they didn't cause there wasn't anything else they could do. And that's not a knock on them either. It's just there wasn't anything else they could do. They'd 
waddle down the aisle in those jumpsuits that, that they had made, the matching jumpsuits. And especially where the ropes were cables instead of real ropes, they would actually have to take the bottom rope, one of the turnbuckles, they'd unscrew it and take the bottom rope down so that they could roll into the ring under the second rope because they couldn't get under the bottom rope. Did you ever see that? You never saw them. It, definitely in person. You weren't fucking born. What am I saying? I've only seen a few clips that I'm actually wrestling, but I um, saw them live, obviously. Well, yeah, and and what the deal was, they they worked Louisville uh, probably in the 70s, probably four times. I saw them, I think, two of those times. Um, a couple of them were even before I started going. But they'd take the bottom rope off, they'd roll in, and they'd bring out um, if they didn't have ring stairs, they'd bring out a, a box, a big wooden thing so that, cause they couldn't get on the apron, right? Cause the apron wasn't wide enough. So the, the partner that was on the apron would have to stand, you know, as a matter of fact, they stood on a box one time and one time he stood inside the ring because that was when they had the, the smaller ring ropes. He couldn't step through the fucking ring or couldn't step through the ropes. Anyway, the point is the heels would just bump off of them and they couldn't do anything for a couple minutes. And then they'd gouge one of the brother's eyes and he'd be blind and they'd choke him over the rope and it'd get a little steam. And then he'd finally waddle over and make the tag to the other brother who would either get in or already was in and would just have to, you know, leave the corner and he'd, then they'd belly bump the fucking heels and they'd take more bumps. And then, you know, I don't, I, it, I think they actually, the last couple of years of their career, they even quit doing the splash because they, they got to where they couldn't really control it. And they just kind of rolled forward on a guy. Cause if, if they rolled forward, they were only six feet tall, but they were 700 pounds a piece. So they had to flap their arms. You could tell whether they were rolling or walking and they would just kind of fall forward. And it was a roll from the belly to the chest. But one night, Oh God, what was her name? This old lady that was there at ringside for years at the gardens and had the big beehive hairdo. She got a picture. They put the McGuire twins against all four of the managers, Sam Bass, Sir Clements, uh, I think JC Dykes and Oh God, maybe Jimmy Kent four on two handicap. And they did the deal where they, they shot all the managers in the corner and then did the belly bumps to them. And Sam Bass was in the back. He was in 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 front of the turnbuckle with all the other managers in front. And when they came in, boom, he had white trunks on and black leg. He shit his fucking trunks. And a big fucking brown stain came up on these white trunks. But anyway. Um, did you ever see, um, there was an article, I want to say it was in Wrestling Confidential. And probably like 65, if I had to guess. About Happy Humphrey going to the weight loss clinic. And losing a bunch of weight? I, you know, as a matter of fact, um, it's mentioned in one of the Guinness Book of World Records volumes that he later, if I'm not mistaken, at least at that time, held the record for most weight lost. Oh, no shit. Be because he got, he went from 800 pounds at his height to like uh, 200 and something pounds or whatever. And then it was and that, that oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, have you noticed that this guy, 800 pounds in 19 fucking 70 was the heaviest human that had ever lived. And now five of them have their own fucking TV shows that we know about <laughs> that are a thousand pounds a piece. And what we have be just become a nation of fat fucks. But go ahead. Remember that picture of him against Haystack Calhoun? And it's just them like meeting in the center of the ring, their bellies touching. <laughs> Can you imagine having had to see that match? No, I can't even imagine how they. Could oh lock no! Up. How could they even lock up? I don't think because of the size of their bellies. I'm not making a joke or anything. I don't think they could like get their arms to touch each other. No, because and well, Haystacks once again with modern eyes and all these fat fucks we see on TV it wasn't that that big. But Happy Humphrey had T Rex arms too. He couldn't fucking no. He couldn't reach out in front of his his stomach. And it had to be a boom 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 a very short affair uh but you know now i guess think about this then were there any fat guys then we started going with the, with the tall guys because andre got over so good in the 70s then everybody needed to be a tall giant after the early 80s when the mcguires were gone haystacks was gone uh man mountain mike was gone were there any other guys 
that were specifically in the business because of their a tremendous weight that couldn't really do anything because then you went to, I mean, Yoko, as we saw the other day, he was moving faster than Luger. He could go at that weight. Uh, it wasn't like just the fat guy belly bump Bigelow, you know, wasn't that huge, but he could go there were, you know, we, we went to height and then those guys, some of them couldn't work, but the big weight guys started becoming physical marvels. I don't know how much IWCCW you ever watched, but there was a guy named Curly Moe, and he was massive. I rem I remember that, and he had a bald head, right? <laughs> and he did. He talked like Curly yeah, he, he from Curly, the Three Stooges. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Curly Moe. Well, I mean, on the end, there there were still, and I mean, Dennis Corluzzo had some sizable individuals. The Purple Bomber comes to mind um, <laughs> on his shows. Well, there was the fake, um, the fake. Either son or grandson, I forget what his story was, of Haystack Calhoun, Boss Hog Calhoun. Yeah. <laughs> who was just so big and smelly that he figured, if I yeah. say I'm related to Haystack, people will believe me, and they did. But, the, but there were, on the independents, you know, and probably still are out there today, there's some, as a matter of fact, didn't we see a, a, an internet video go viral of some like 500 pound guy trying to do a dive and just falling way short uh, at some point a while back. But anyway, on the independence, there's something, but as a mainstream attraction, the, the big guy, the fat guys, that's, you know, that's what they were. That's what they were called. The fat guys kind of fell out of favor. Um, I think people started seeing through it, you know, that, you had to do something you couldn't just because the mcguire twins bless their hearts and what sweet sweet people that they were but you you wouldn't couldn't be scared of them or intimidated of them because there's no way they could catch you and there's almost no way they could whip you because they were just almost immobile anyway you know what the big problem was don't you brian no i'll tell you what the big problem was the McGuire twins were not taking their athletic greens. That explains it. If Billy and Benny <laughs> McGuire over there, when they were young little fellers in Hendersonville, North Carolina, they were big bouncing babies. But if they had been regular on their athletic greens, they would not only have been regular in every other aspect of their daily life, but they would have been healthy. They could have controlled their weight and their blood pressure. Because when you drink your athletic greens, the daily drink that's like a nutritional insurance policy for your body, developed from a complex blend of 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, you are addressing the four pillars of health, energy, recovery, gut health, and immune support. And as we've mentioned several times, it keeps you pooping on a regular and pleasant basis, uh, packed with all the things that you need to make sure that you get your vitamin C, your zinc citrate, all in one solution. And Brian, you like the way it mixes up, nice and easy. Yes, it's very, very easy. I'm someone who has done a lot of juicing in my life, and juicing's great, except it takes forever and the cleanup takes forever. Other than that, it's wonderful. Well, take out the cleanup, take out the preparation, and just go right to Athletic Greens. You get all the nutrients, all the vitamins. It's fantastic. I can't even imagine... The McGuire twins with gut health. I don't know what that would oh. be like. Why, holy mackerel, it'd have been better than Pepper Gomez, the man with the cast iron <laughs> stomach. And I just, I laugh on a wrestling program when somebody admits to juicing on a regular basis. I really do. But it's not the superstar Billy Graham kind of juicing, nor, nor the great Muta style type of juicing. It is the healthy type of juicing you do with the athletic greens. Uh, Stacy has her mixer right there next to the uh, uh refrigerator in the kitchen so that every morning she can put her scoop in mix it up drink it down help support the heart the immune system the respiratory system and vitamin d that's important right now if you get your supply of athletic greens through my podcast they're also going to give you up to a year's supply of vitamin d3 and k2 you get vitamin D from the sun, and it's recommended as an important supplement. Well, if you're inside staying away from the plague, you're not out in the sun, this is going to fix you up. 
helps, supports, as I said, the heart, the immune system, the respiratory system. So whether you're looking to boost your energy levels, support your immune system, or address your gut health, now's the perfect time to try Athletic Greens. And if you visit athleticgreens.com slash JCE, you can claim my special offer, the free D3K2 Wellness Bundle, with your first purchase, that's up to a one-year supply of vitamin D as an added value. When you try this delicious and comprehensive daily all-in-one drink, you will be hard-pressed, ladies and gentlemen, to find a more comprehensive nutritional bundle anywhere else. Athleticgreens.com slash JCE. It cures hoarseness. It cures the most stubborn case of hoarseness. It One second. It doesn't cure horseness. It cures horseness. Oh my god. Oh, I'm sorry. That was that was my WC Fields uh flashback. But anyway, athleticgreens.com slash JCE. Real quick, as a quick aside, did you see Anderson Cooper's interview the other day with the My Pillow Schmuck? Oh God, no, I can't tolerate the My Pillow Schmuck's face or voice. But did did he did he uh, pummel him about the head and face? Well, he pummeled him because he's now trying to push this miracle cure for COVID-19. And he kept oh, saying, uh, it's a miracle cure. And Anderson's like, you know, you're a snake oil salesman, right? You know, that's what you're doing. He's like, no, no, no. God sent me here to help everyone. And I saw a feature of, about him on, I think, CBS Sunday morning. And this stuck with me. And whenever we see him on TV, me and Suzanne laugh thinking about this. He's so bizarre in those commercials, wearing his silk shirt. He just seems so disingenuous. Apparently. Just a few years back, right before he started his little pillow company. By the way, I guess I can say a big pillow company. But he was a hardcore crackhead. And (laughs) he was so bad. He was such a bad drug addict that his dealers held an intervention for him. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) And he said it. He said it in the the feature. And And Suzanne's like, I've never heard of that. I'm like, no. They don't usually say, hey, this guy's a great customer. He needs help. Well, you can tell he's he's gone from one addiction to the other and from one mental illness to the other because he's the guy who came out and said, God sent us President Trump and God did this. So he's gone from the drugs to the invisible man in the sky and he's gone from drug dealers to Donald Trump. And now he's peddling miracle cures. And and the the, 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 the first place I want to get my pharmaceuticals from is a pillow salesman. Right off the bat. That's that's I can't miss. Someone get that man some athletic greens. I'd like to get him a grassy knoll. All right. <laughs> anyway. Talking about the my pillow guy. I don't think he has FBI support. Anyway, um, should we talk about the Thunderdome the Thunderdome? Well, just to be clear, I watched the first few minutes of SmackDown, and then the last few minutes. I didn't watch the whole thing. I wanted yeah. to get an idea of it. By the way, I used the cornet rule. Once I saw teleportation, I'm out. And that's well, when I turned it off. See, here's the thing. I could not invoke that rule because the lights actually did go out, and he didn't vanish in front of our eyes. He didn't vanish out of an enclosed uh, ice machine or out from underneath the water of a swimming pool or whatever. The lights were out for three seconds. Of course, there was no time for him to realistically get away, but also that was two minutes in the program. I wanted to see their fucking special effects. But thanks a lot, Brian, for watching the whole thing like me. You didn't say we were going to review it. You didn't say watch SmackDown. Well, I didn't watch the whole thing anyway. I said watch the Thunderdome. I kept waiting through the whole program to see what the Thunderdome was going to do next. Well, I knew we were reviewing SummerSlam. I didn't have to watch the Thunderdome the first night of the Thunderdome. Well, but it's not its not just one. I, I, I assumed the debut, the deflowering of the Thunderdome would be a big deal. I saw That's five why I minutes. Watched it. I saw five minutes of that deflowering, and I was ready to, I was ready for a born-again virgin, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, well, now, wait a minute. Now, look here. The director of this program, Buster Cherry, had a, a great slate of... <laughs> Of a special effects that they, because that's why I had to watch the whole show because I figured, well, the Thunderdome is going to do a lot of shit, right? The Thunderdome is going to have all the lighting effects. Well, we figured that and, and 
boy, it's it's a ball buster. That's some that's a lighting rig, and that's a goddamn technical fucking marvel to put together, and all the different moving pieces. Having not only done TV production for the WWE back in those days, the '90s when it was primitive compared to this but also having done other productions and more recent ones, low budget ones where you're like, Oh shit. If we could just go to Best Buy and get a fucking 60 inch widescreen, we'd have a Titan Tron. And also uh, seen the WWE production from a couple of years ago when I was down there at the hall of fame thing. Wow. Great fucking business. Expensive. Took a lot of work running that thing. All the feeds to all the screens. Holy crap. And the light of lighting effects are amazing and they change with the different entrances and etc. And the lighting changes and then the lighting changes. Yep. And then the lighting changes and the fans in the seats, except when they drop one of them out because they put up a fucking, uh, like a fucking Ted Panda bear or, you know, somebody says fire velveteen dream the fans in the seats that is a live feed they are moving but you can't tell at least i think some of the time they're moving i've got an 82 inch screen by the time that they've got all those fans in all those seats i can't fucking pick out what anybody's they could be given blowjobs in those little bitty teeny could you tell what they were fucking doing no. Each individual fan, each individual face in those seats. No, I thought it was sensory overload. And uh, I feel bad for someone who, uh, someone's going to have a seizure because of that fucking <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's a, also, it looked to me like they were in a, I I hate to say this, they've gone to all the work. That's why I said the, the work into it was amazing. And the technical people par excellence and they're professionals to pull this off. But is it polishing a turd if there's nothing different going on besides the lighting and the fact that the, the, the fans look like they wallpapered the back wall with the Sunday comic funny section? It just looks like colored squares. And that's not... The crowd noise is not what those people on the screen the noise that they are making in their individual little fucking boxes in their virtual chairs, that's still, that's not, they don't, because then you'd hear a bunch of people go, fuck you, or whatever. So it's piped in, am I right here? It's piped in crowd noise. Oh, it's ridiculously piped in, yeah. Okay. And the visual is real fans in their homes, but they're so tiny that it just looks like colored post-it notes on all the seats. And it, so the fans are at home watching the show live on TV. The crowd noise is just recorded and put in where appropriate. And boy, that has to be a pain in the ass too. Uh, even though you can tell of, I, I think I like the actual human beings in the building beating on the plexiglass better for a wrestling match. I mean, the entrances are great. If they had this lighting and this apparatus, with in at a WrestleMania or a big event show with actual fans in the arena, well, that would be the best of everything. But I do not see how that I do, I'm not even sure it made it more pleasant to look at it, but it hasn't changed the content of the show unless the lighting grid suddenly starts shitting wrestlers out into the ring and they start having matches. It's a, a very remarkably revolutionary, professionally lit, empty building with wrestling going on in it. And the, the content of the show was pretty much the same as it's been, right? Yeah, that was my big thing. That was why I checked out right away. I figured, let me see what this is like. And they chased me off within five minutes because brand new set, brand new look, new concept, same creative, same bullshit. Bray Wyatt waving goodbye and vanishing. A, a gang of seemingly hundreds of people hitting the ring. I don't know why no one stopped them and beating up everyone. Well, wait a minute. You're jumping ahead for the people, for the, the many hundreds of thousands in our audience who only watch the shows after we talk about them so they can see how bad they are. Let's catch people up. Vince opened the show. 
And that's that's big time, especially these days. He's not out there all the time. But Vince McMahon, biggest star they fucking got, right? Welcome to the Thunderdome. He gave it the old Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul introduction. He barely says <laughs> five words. <laughs> And then the lights go out and then here comes the fiend entrance and, you know, wonderful lighting effects of, you know, blah, blah, blah. It took forever because they wanted to see, you to see their new toy and he gets in the ring and he's face to face with Vince McMahon. And you, you can hear the people screaming, but you, there's obviously no one there, but then Braun Strowman's entrance interrupts and they do another goddamn procession that it was happy Humphrey ran to the ring quicker than these people. And when Braun Strowman gets in the ring, Vince is gone. He never see Vince again. That's why I was, as soon as I saw Vince, I was like, this is going to be good. They should never have Vince on television unless he's going to do or say something Vince ish to give you a, a payoff to the thing. It, it I mean, it, he vanished and it not teleported. He just, he was gone and was not referred to anymore. Did I miss that? If only that was the, the way things. Well, could go you that know, company. But, no, that was it. I mean, look, they hyped up Vince being there because they just wanted to get people in the door. And once people were in the door, they got Vince out of the door. <laughs> so then both Braun Strowman and fiend, Stare at face to face as I was an old big bad John promo about him and Plowboy Frazier. Talk about the fat guys, right? Face to face. We faced each other, stuck out our bellies and run at each other. When the crash came and the dust fell still, tiny Frazier, the big man was killed. Anyway, I can remember that from 1976. I don't know what these people said when I, I watched it sometimes earlier today. Anyway, they're staring at each other forever. 15 ninjas hit the fucking apron and the lights go out. And when the lights come back on, as you said, the fiend was gone. And now Braun Strowman's alone with the 15 ninjas. The 15 ninjas comprise the new group of retribution, right? Is this, is, was that the name of this group? Yes. It yes. is the WWE's retribution. version of the dark order. Apparently. Well, yeah, the there's, <laughs> There's a group on each fucking side of the fence here, a bunch of fucking tiny jobbers in indiscriminate black fucking outfits. Um, but retribution sounds almost like revolution. That was my idea in OVW in 2000 and fucking three. I'll, I'll accept, uh, royalty payments. Uh, but anyway, they jump Braun Strowman and he's trying to fight back, but there's 15 of them. And after forever, Everybody comes out and hits the ring at once. All the WWE locker room. We talk about nobody come in these beatdowns. Either nobody comes, nobody comes forever, and then everybody comes at once. Or I I don't know what the fucking the parameters are for this. Remember we said the guys got kidnapped unmolested, but Adam Cole and Pat McAfee were about to fight on NXT a couple weeks ago, and everybody came out up to and including Triple H. But anyway, all the WWE guys that come out and hit the ring and beat the retribution guys off, including, did you see there was a fucking blonde girl hit the ring on the WWE side and was in the fucking fight and didn't even mess her makeup up. <laughs> what the fuck? This goddamn, these 15 unknown ninjas are beating up the world's strongest man, Braun Strowman, and we got to go save him. And I'm, oh, yeah, come on, Penelope, whatever your fucking name is, you 120-pound blonde girl, you'll turn the tide here for us. Uh, then Braun Strowman beat up a few of the people that saved his ass. And this took 10 fucking minutes, and it was hot garbage. And let me ask you this question. Who's retribution going to be revealed to be? What is their purpose? What is their reason for coming? Who are those masked men under their disguises? I have no idea. Okay. Normally, if you have a mystery person or people with a mystery person, uh, the, the big reveal is the most important part of this thing. Whether it's the guy behind the curtain or the guy under the mask or the guy in the box or whether it's the, the group that invades and takes off their mask to reveal 
when you see the face, you know who the fuck it is. You're go, oh my gosh, that's part of the fucking reveal. It has to be somebody. It can't be fucking Putz McGee and, you know, the Bobsy twins. It has to be somebody that they're going to be shot. Oh shit, it's them. If if it's one guy or two guys or three guys, you might could be motivated to believe it's going to be them. It's going to be somebody. We're going to, we're supposed to believe that 15 fucking top guys have just <laughs> suddenly appeared. This is going to be 15 people that fucking matter. And, and, and the, where they're going to be revealed and this is their motivation. This is why we're all together. Either that or two or three fucking wrestlers hire 15 fucking guys off the street to wear these stupid outfits and join in this thing, even though they have no fucking skin in the game, they got no personal grudge or they don't, they're not going to get ahead somehow by doing this. How the fuck do you come up with 15 of these fuckers by what logic and what universe does any of this make any sense? Well, watch, it'll be just like when they had the anonymous raw general manager for seemingly forever. They had that. And then it turned out they had no plan for what it was going to be. They came up with the concept, they had no idea who the general manager was going to be. And then at the end of the day, I think it was Hornswoggle. I wasn't watching then, but I went through the Black Scorpion. So I, I you yeah, know, know same, what the same fucking, concept. Yeah. Same concept. We have an idea. Because, I mean, that's the thing. Is it just going to be the NXT guys, in which case it'll be a letdown? Who's going to be the leader of it? Is it going to be someone we know? In that case, who could it be that it wouldn't be a letdown? I don't know. I don't care. WWE doesn't know how to put together compelling content in 2020. But, oh, well, then the next thing was compelling because the Big E and Sheamus started arguing. See, all the guys came out of the ring and ran the, the ninjas off into the hinterlands. But then Big E and Sheamus, because they had some heat from last week, they started arguing. And they said, well, we'll just have our match right now. So all the rest of the WWE talent surrounded the ring looking in fear for those 15 midget ninjas that they ran off uh, while Big E and Sheamus had a fucking match. And to be quite honest, um, they had a decent fucking match. They can work. Nice, solid lockups. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, Sheamus, to me, is just so visually unappealing. Out of it just, He needs some iron in his blood, something. Hey, anyway, hey, speaking of these ninjas, it's a closed set. People can't well, just be walking around on the streets right now. People aren't just walking around in gangs. But they're wearing their masks. How did they get into the building? They went through the ninja COVID tent <laughs> to where they test the ninjas for, where, for COVID. <laughs> and that, would be, was, that would be a great gimmick. All the wrestlers have come down with COVID. We think it's retribution. We they're think- in Orlando, right? They <laughs> got right. that on inter- on International Boulevard. It's it's <laughs> right next to the double tree we used to stay at down the street there from the the fucking water park. The the ninja COVID testing tent. It is Orlando. We're gonna find out. It's like a bunch of furloughed Disney World employees. <laughs> <laughs> they just had to storm WWE. <laughs> All right, let's see who's that motherfucker. It's got the problem with Mickey, huh? That's pretty good. Thank you. That's a good Mickey. Anyway. Um, I, this one, I was zoning off though. I wrote fans look, do they move? Is this a still shot? I couldn't tell at that point. The guys around the ring weren't involved. They were a distraction. Guess what their break spot was, Brian, for this match. I don't know. They're just wrestling. And all of a sudden the, the fucking arena lights flicker again. And the announcer says, is retribution here again? And they go to the break. And when they come back, the lights are on. They're still wrestling. Apparently, Ret- Retribution wasn't here again. It was never mentioned again. I mean, the, the, this is such cheesiness. This is like they're, they're writing television for a bunch of fucking gullible fucking Republicans with these goddamn sucker questions at the, just don't switch the channel because something might happen, fucking teases. Good God. Hey, I only watched the first few minutes and the last few minutes, but I could say just based off seeing that and then watching TakeOver, while Corey Graves isn't the greatest, he's a lot better when he's not next to Michael Cole, who is just the worst commentator in wrestling, maybe ever because so many guys now in WWE copy him, copy his mannerisms, copy his way of speaking. Their hands are going all over the place. Even Corey Graves has that problem. 
Michael Cole, Terry Funk was just on a 1990 episode of Pro Wrestling Spotlight Then and Now, or well, Pro Wrestling Spotlight that we reviewed on Then and Now, the podcast that John Arezzi and I do. And he good, said- Good plug there, by the way. Well, thank you very much, pwspod.com. But Terry said, because he was asked about the fact that the NWA keeps changing commentators and there's issues now with Paul Lee and Jim Cornette and Terry and Chris are gone and Missy Hyatt's doing commentary. And Terry said- and Terry was a really wise guy when it came to figuring out what made things work in wrestling. Yeah. He said, the most important thing about your wrestling show is the commentator. It's the most important thing about your show. The WWE is commentators that make me run for the mute button. That says a lot. It's every show. It's every show they have. It's either well, a three-man booth that's unnecessary. It's Michael Cole. It's guys copying Michael Cole. It's guys speaking to me in a way. Do they think I'm an idiot? Do they think I'm a child? Do they think I'm an idiot child? Why are they talking to me this way? The most important thing about your wrestling show is your commentator. You know, at least with AEW, even with Excalibur there, at least the commentators don't talk down to me. At least Jim Ross, he is what he is at this point in his life, a cranky, drunken old man. <laughs> Oh, God. Wow. You know, oh. I'm, not, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying that's what he is. He doesn't hide that on the air. He's not all of a sudden Mr. Excitement. Yeah. Shivani is. You know, they're being themselves. And Shivani is excited. He doesn't yeah. He doesn't give a shit. He, he walked away from wrestling for 20 years. He comes back and they're He's having fucking a great doing time. matches on the football field. He don't give a shit. Yeah. AEW, the, I mean, uh, WWE, the commentating across the board is all. You are an idiot child. They're talking, and, and Vince loves it when they ask, the announcer should ask questions, uh, you know, get the fans wondering, okay, yes, you should do that, but you also shouldn't do just only that. But Kevin Dunn has taken it and run with it. Michael Cole, and I like Michael Cole. I've never had a crossword with him. He actually, when he did an NXT show without Vince in his ear and could kind of actually call the matches, he did pretty fucking good that time. Um, but Kevin Dunn's trained Michael Cole to be his idea of a fucking WWF announcer and Michael Cole's trained everybody else to do the same thing. And that's where it's become, you know, uh, to, to what, 21 years later, I, the, the first fucking SmackDown was me and Michael Cole. He'd been there like fucking three weeks or whatever. Uh, but now he's, uh, they, they view him as. And I'm not knocking Michael. I just said I like him. But he's not Gordon Soley. He's not Lance Russell. He's not Jim Ross because he never called wrestling into territory to be able to have good wrestling to call and to be taught how to call it right. He is the perfect WWE announcer because that's what they they want. And he does it well. It's just, it's, you know. He's perfect for what they want. He's not perfect to getting people to actually want to listen to the commentators. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't say those two things were the same thing. Those. <laughs> and he may have as big a negative influence on wrestling now than almost anybody. Because look at the commentators: the Tom Phillips guy in NXT, the Josh Matthew guy that's now with Impact. Well, remember, every time I do a review, I would say, and then Michael Cole said, and you'd say that's not Michael Cole. That's what it sounds just like him. Yeah. They all, it's like a school of Michael Cole that has spread across the wrestling universe. He's awful. Anyway. The worst. Speaking of awful and the worst, so this match continued. At that point, I wrote, their gravy is already all over my plate. And we're not 20 minutes in this show. Uh, the finish was Matt Riddle and the Possum King got a schmoz out on the floor and distracted uh, Seamus for Big E to roll him up one, two, three. Uh, moving on, the next match was the Lucha House Party versus Shinsuke Nakamura and Cesaro. And as much as I love Claudio Castagnoli, seriously, you expect me to watch a match featuring anybody named Lucha House Party? Uh, skipping ahead, <laughs> Sasha and Bailey did a promo. Um, Corey Graves interviewed him, and for whatever reason, it looked like he'd rather be at the dentist than do this interview. I don't know. It just... I like Bailey. Um, I've liked her work and I've I've heard her do good promos. And I, this whole thing was the announcer and the two girls reading a rec or reciting a memorized script complete with fake laughs. And I fast forwarded some more. And I got to Naomi versus Sasha. And I fast forwarded some more. And Asuka was in there. Oh, once again. Jim Cornette hates women's wrestling. And I fast-forwarded some more. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And then 
who saw oh sonia sonia was there sonia was in the ring and she because i wrote it looked like sorry but it's my writing i was writing quickly sonia was in the ring and she was faced off no she wasn't in the ring this was a backstage thing it was just it was every time i would stop fast forwarding there'd be women wrestlers on my screen but Sonya slapped, who's the blonde with the bad plastic surgery that I've mentioned here several weeks back and God damn all hell broke loose and I was the worst human being in the world because I said she shouldn't have got her bad plastic surgery. What is her name? Well, based on the qualifications you just laid out there, I believe you'd be speaking about Dana Brooke. Dana Brooke. Well, Sonya slapped old Dana Brooke. Her lips practically fucking slid right off her face. Um, and I fast forwarded some more. Awful. And then Sonya Deville was in the ring doing a live promo. And I, this, I wrote, God damn, are there any men on this roster? But she cut a fired up promo. And at least it, this was worth watching uh, on her friend uh, that everybody in the country now knows that, you know, has sleepovers with her and they have girls night and eat fucking s'mores together. Uh, but she's mad at her on television. But it was a good promo, and she said, fuck it. Let's up the ante and make it, it's already hair versus, let's make it loser leaves WWE. So apparently, and and I have stayed away from any SummerSlam news, even though it took place as we record this, uh, what, 12 hours ago or whatever, last evening. But did they, did someone not only get their head shaved, but leave town? Or did, I wasn't sure whether they dropped the hair versus hair. I believe they did. I'm not positive, but I made I'm okay. But they sure made it. They, did. Yeah. they made it loser. Well, didn't you want to see the hair versus hair between these girls that was advertised more than you'd want to see a loser leave town, especially when nobody believes anymore that somebody's going to leave? Well, I think in this situation, someone wanted to leave and someone was going to leave. Based on what just happened the previous. Well, then wouldn't they? Well, wait a minute. What are you? Okay, then spoil the goddamn thing for me. Who quit? Did did one of these girls quit over this fucking deal that happened at their house? I don't know if she quit, but Sonya Deville at a minimum is taking a break from WWE after this happened. And I can completely understand why she would do that. Well, is she going to take a break from eating also? No, she's going to take a break from being on national television where crazy fucking fans could potentially fall in love with her and come up with a plan to kidnap her. Well, it's already goddamn happened. How's it go? Now's the perfect time for her to continue wrestling. You it's can already, see how like, someone could be Wait a minute, it's, it's like when I, when I used to fly with flair. That's the only time I felt safe being on a plane. I'm like, how many people be in two fucking plane crashes, right? It's already happened to her. Now she's good. What's the fucking odds now? Well, first of all, we don't know what other correspondence she has or has not received from other crazy fans. But second of all, I'm sure you can understand her being spooked by this whole thing. Well, yes, but to quit her fucking job when it didn't, it, 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 it you know. Uh... Someone just broke into her house and at a minimum was going to kidnap her. He was prepared. He drove down from South Carolina, broke into her house, and thankfully she was able to get away with Mandy Rose. Okay. I can understand but, why she would say, you know what? I need some time for me right now. I'm freaked out. This was a really scary thing. Okay, well then don't make it to stipulation. Loser leaves WWE. Because what she is she gonna come back in three fucking weeks when she calms down? Was it the, leaves if, WWE if, if, forever? If I if what now? Was it leave WWE forever? I didn't see well, the No, interview. but goddamn it, she comes back in less than fucking six months. It's gonna be bullshit. Well, it's bullshit anyway, but if I was a fucking checkout clerk at Kroger and somebody, because of that job, wanted to fucking kidnap me and throw me in the trunk of a car, I'd quit Kroger. But once again, not when I'm a goddamn national television star making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, I'd get me a goddamn better burglar alarm and a big fucking pit bull. With that said, I could certainly understand this happening and someone saying, you know what, I want to be off the grid for a while. I'm going to go to Hawaii. Well, there you, in that case, yeah, don't make a stipulation out of it. Who was going to get their head shaved? I, I was thinking it was going to be Sonya Deville getting her head okay, shaved. Okay, well, then do that and then go off to Hawaii and grow your hair back. And then you fulfill the thing that people <laughs> wanted to see, what was fucking advertised. You take your break. 
you don't tell any, maybe you get hurt in a fucking match and that's why you have to have your head shaved. So you've got an out. And then when you come to your senses and realize, well, I'm still a major goddamn television star. And so I probably should not be a hermit for the rest of my life at this stage of my earning potential. Then she comes back, she's healed up from her injury and ready to get even for having her head shaved. But now she loses a fucking loser leave WWE, which is not as attractive in a girls match as hair versus hair. And then when she realized, well, fuck, I need to come back and, you know, I'm, I'm sure they would pay her for a while, but they ain't going to pay her for fucking two years while she studies to become a fucking nun somewhere in Bolivia. We don't know what her future plans are. We don't know if she's planning on coming back. Well, she was planning on having her head shaved on pay-per-view this weekend until just goddamn recently, so I don't think I'd be making any long-term decisions this quickly while in that fucking state of mind. And when she decided that she was going to be leaving for, at a minimum, a good period of time, she said, you know what, I don't want to shave my head anymore. <laughs> I can understand that Well, that's that the too. time you should shave you. She wanted to shave her head and then be on fucking television? Well, WWE gave a bonus what was, payoff. Besides, going to... Like That's Mexico? exactly, I swear, I was about to say, besides what was her bonus going to be for what, no, these, these people today, a guy will shave his head for fucking anything, right? They shave it on purpose in the, in their fucking homes, but no, I guarantee you b before this was advertised, they had, a, had some one agree to drop the hair and it had to be, I would think for a bonus and it was probably instigated by the girl's idea to begin with. So yeah, she was going to get a fucking payoff for it. I'm sure. Whatever, anyway. whatever she does, I hope she's happy and feels safe. And maybe we are lucky enough to see her again in wrestling, but either way, I just hope she, she just went through a pretty traumatic experience. I hope she's yeah, okay. So go to Hawaii for a month, grow your hair, <laughs> 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 fucking uh, uh, convalesce from your injury and come back when you're, in, uh, you're rested and relaxed because you're going to make millions of fucking dollars. What, she, what else is she going to do? If she's in the public eye, she is who she is. She's going to attract fucking attention if she's in the public eye. So she's suddenly going to fucking you know, knit fucking socks and do quilting somewhere. All right. Anyway, great promo, Sonya. I, nobody could believe it after reading the fucking newspaper, but great promo. Anyway, uh, Firefly Funhouse uh, teases came up and I fast forwards, fast forwarded. Um, then we came to the Intercontinental title match, AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy. And through the show, they had been selling that Jeff Hardy had a bad knee. The doctor had been looking at it. They'd been having, you know, back in the medical facility backstage, uh, the doctor had been checking it out. I don't need to critique these guys' work. I was looking forward to seeing this. And then I was like, you know, I wish they had, weren't doing the deal where Jeff, maybe Jeff's knee really is bad. I don't know, but it did. I didn't think so after I saw this match because he sold it too good. But um, I was thinking that's probably going to handicap him. Actually, it made it better. Uh, AJ Styles, by the way, takes a great backdrop. And so many people don't take backdrops at all anymore. But the way that they did this match, once that fucking Jeff was selling it to begin with, but once AJ started working on the leg, Jeff Hardy can sell. And it's he can work. This was the best match I have seen Jeff Hardy work. He didn't do any of his regular shit. He sold the shit out of that fucking leg. Having to slow down and work shows that he can work. Because usually you think Matt was the worker and Jeff was one did all the fucking crazy shit. But it, 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 this was, and AJ's so smooth, right? Uh, at one point of the match, Stacy came in the room and I tried to explain the Thunderdome and the Amway Center and the virtual fans and the fake crowd noise. And I missed a bit of this, but she walked out of the room when I got to and see all the fans in the stands. They're on, at home on their phones and she just fuck. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, did you notice? No, you didn't. You didn't watch enough. They're used also, in addition to the Thunderdome, they've revolutionized wrestling television production. One of the floor cameras has a fisheye lens makes the ring look bigger and the backdrop look higher. Um, do the, do the kids these days know what the fisheye lens is? Oh, I'm sure they do. Cause they have that oh. on their smartphones. Oh, fuck. all right. Anyway. Hey, were they doing the thing drives me crazy. And I haven't watched SummerSlam yet either. 
Were they doing a thing where basically the camera switches on every move? I mean, not even every move. If you throw a punch right before you connect, they cut to the next camera. And then you know, go back, and then I'll go to the. No- I mean, it's nonstop. It takes they, me out of they the were, match. They were doing some of that, but they weren't doing the fucking quick zoom in and out every time somebody throws a punch where it makes you really drunk, dizzy. They weren't doing that. At least it, it didn't, you know, uh, seem to. Uh, but anyway, in this match, Jeff Hardy made a a, a quick one legged comeback and hit a swanton. One, two, three. It, it was nice. The Firefly Funhouse came up, and I just cannot watch this at all. I just can't watch it. So I fast-forwarded to the end. Braun Strowman comes in and gloms Bray Wyatt and knocks him out of camera range. You know, the camera's just locked down on their little puppet show set. And Braun Strowman does the sh- I don't. Why do guys do this? It, when they're obviously, especially the worse workers they are, the more they do this. But every time they throw a punch in like an empty arena or a backstage brawl or whatever, who, 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 like, does anybody do that when you're actually hitting somebody? Are you going, ooh, ooh, ooh? Does that, a, is that a thing? I don't do that typically when I'm punching people. Well, I, it just sounds phony as fuck. But anyway. So they go to the break after he drags him off the set. And they come back from the break. They're fighting in the garage and near the loading dock. And one of the, I believe it was Corey Graves, might have said this. One of the announcers did. I quote, destruction is going to be otherworldly between these two. And then, seconds later, Braun Strowman got Bray Wyatt like for a choke slam. But he didn't really pick him way up in the air. He just kind of fucking pushed him backwards off the fucking loading dock, right? And then it's one of those reaction deals where you see everybody else's face, but in the in the when he pitched him off the loading dock, you didn't see him land, but you saw his foot stop still in the camera shot. You go back and watch it now, folks. Now that I've spoiled it for you, you see Bray Wyatt's left foot stop when he's obviously at ground level. And then you get the shot of them looking from the loading dock and down and he's on concrete and he's way down there. Right. So they couldn't even reshoot this fucking, I don't know what they're fucking doing, but anyway, the ambulance comes in within seconds. Did you, did you get back for the ambulance part? Yeah, this was the end of the show that I actually did see. Yes. Okay. The ambulance is there within seconds and they did not only stagey referee acting, but bad fake EMT medical treatment. They got a, a, a double there. Poor Adam Pierce was selling like an auctioneer. He was working his ass off trying to make this goddamn unbelievable horse shit look real. But, and even he banged on the ambulance, according to Twitter, and fucking, I think, broke his thumb. But the referees are just, yes. The referees are just yelling it's shit you wouldn't yell. The EMTs look bullshit. There's no, it's, it's too fast. They're, it's not going to happen. Then they put him in the ambulance. They close Bray Wyatt. They close the fucking doors. The ambulance pulls down a ways and then stops. And they're screaming, go, go, go. Then the ambulance backs up. And then you see everyone's face, all the referees and the agents and the people that have been out there with a look of horror. And then you pan back over to the fucking ambulance and there's the fiend standing there in the, with the back doors of the ambulance open. He wasn't the fiend when he went in there. This is the teleportation rule, but luckily this was the end of the program, but fuck this sucks is what I wrote. This fucking sucks. If you were going to do this fucking horse shit, you couldn't even have had him throw somebody out the back doors of the ambulance and bust it open like Christopher Lee in the fucking episode of the Avengers where he's a goddamn automaton and he keeps coming back to life and the fucking guy busts out the back doors of the ambulance. No, they just went to a reaction shot. Fuck this sucks. I, I have come to Bray Wyatt has come to mean everything I dislike about wrestling now teleportation, invulnerability, fucking these goddamn Firefly Funhouse. I'd like all take all those puppets and just ball them all up and shove them straight up his fucking ass. So that put me in a real good mood to watch AEW. 
But uh, what what was your final SmackDown thoughts, Great Brian Last? Well, again, just watching the beginning and the end, and now hearing you recap the middle. <clears throat> That's basically how I felt. You could do that sound over and over and over again. It's not fun to watch this show. It doesn't entertain me. It just sucks. It's so bad that it's just so fucking bad. (laughs) I hate this fucking company and this stupid fucking shows. I turned it off at the beginning because Bray Wyatt teleported away and then this gang of mystery men came in there while Michael Cole screamed at me. And then I came back at the end to see Adam Pierce and a bunch of guys standing there like it's Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Bray <laughs> Wyatt standing in the ambulance. I'm <sighs> not entertained by this at all. I don't find this good in any way. In fact, I hate it. <laughs> and you know what? Now I'm pissed off because now I know that because I haven't watched SummerSlam yet because we're not going to talk about it until the experience this week. And there is a number of, as a matter of fact, I've, I noticed this. There's a number of things that I do when I know I have to watch the wrestling shows. I try to get all the rest of my things that I need to do first crossed off my list before I go. It's a last resort to watch the shows. I, I take my, my anal suppository. <laughs> I do my self-service dental work. <laughs> I, I in, engage in all manner of activity and and then i end up watching these shows and every time i watch one i know why but now i haven't watched SummerSlam yet but now i can't even look forward to it because i thought i was going to at least get to see one of the girls get their head shaved and now i know that's not going to happen and you know what i got to be honest with you it's easier now than ever before brian to shave your head whether you're a man or a woman <laughs> i didn't see that coming this time. because of manscape. <laughs> Our friends at Manscaped, whether you're a man, a woman, a child, or even a cute little puppy dog, the folks at Manscaped have got something that will make you slicker than cum on a gold tooth, folks. It, it, you know, it, a lot of people, the the question on their mind, the uppermost question on their mind is, when's the last time you shaved your balls, right? Everybody I, wants to know. I don't, huh? I don't know if that's the question on everybody's mind. Well, I'm always, I, you know, I write it down so I don't forget because I want to do it on a regular basis. But the Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0 is now the greatest piece of personal grooming equipment that has ever been invented in the history of personal grooming since we were cavemen slogging up the hill from the swamp. This is the greatest thing because you can... You can trim all your hair without trimming any of your skin. Whether it's your head, your chest, your underarms, your crotchal area, you know, the back, the front, the sides, wherever you've got hair, the lawnmower 3.0 will take it off, will not nick you, will not cut you. You will not look like you've been run through a razor blade factory, folks. It even it's a slight little massage that it gives you. It also has an LED light. So you can see all the little critters, especially down in the nether regions. It's waterproof. You can do this in the shower if it floats your boat. Uh, They also just released the Shears 2.0 nail kit, which is the perfect add-on. Twipped, uh, tipped tweezers or twipped teasers. You know, the, the tweezers certainly teased me. Round point scissors, fingernail clippers, a nail file. You can pluck your eyebrows, trim your nails. You can all, they've got the crop preserver, the crop reviver, like a cologne for your balls. You can tame the summer swamp ass with natural hydrators and antioxidants. And everybody knows if you listen to this show and you're a member of the cult of Cornette, who has the cleanest crotches in all of cultdom, go to manscaped.com and use the code DRIVE. To get 20% off and free shipping, 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE at manscaped.com. Take the bull by the tail and face the situation. They also have very nice cologne. They do. Yeah. Suzanne likes it. And see, Sonia DeVille's hair would have fell off. Holy shit, it would have abandoned ship just as easy as pie with with a lawnmower. Don't know why they didn't do that. <laughs> All right. Hey, did yeah. you see? Hey, one thing, uh, not to play spoiler from SummerSlam, 
But did you see that the first fan has been banned from Thunderdome? No. Was it the Velveteen Dream, Fire Velveteen Dream guy? Or, Apparently or... it was the Fire Velveteen Dream guy. <laughs> if, if it was TNA, they would have said Fire Russo. No, if it was TNA, they just would have put some cardboard cutouts from the fucking local Thornton station in the seats. <laughs> Actually, I see W, when the Poffos did, especially when they did their first TV taping at Channel 62 in Lexington back in 1979, they di just did like fucking eight hours of TV on like a Wednesday during the day. Because that's where the, the TV cameramen and everybody that worked at the station was actually at work. And they got like 10 or 12 friends to come in and be the fans. And they had like cut a, a, a backdrop with cut out images of people. So they set the real people in front of the fake people. That was like the first 16 weeks of TV. Well, the Poffos had painted fans, and we saw Thunderdome. NXT did not use the Thunderdome technology. They were still doing the old school, old school, the oh, recent sure. school NXT <laughs> where people were in face masks, there were boards up, people could hit them, make noise. So what did you think of NXT? I like, I like that atmosphere better for non-fan in arenas wrestling at least you've got some human beings out there. And even now everybody's sweetening the sound, but at least if you have actual human beings within sight, it doesn't, it's not as egregious. Does that make any sense? It does. And I think out of the three shows, I only saw the beginning and end of SmackDown, but I got to hear the awful sweetening of that. It's hard to sweeten the sound on a live show. I've realized it's really ridiculous. Yeah. But SmackDown and AEW, which... You know, AEW had its moments where it's like, geez, this sounds like there's a lot of people yeah. <laughs> and there's no one there. NXT, there was, there was, was the actually, best. there was an outdoor stadium full of people just down the block it, it, that, uh, NXT uh, though, handled the crowd noise the best, I think. Yeah. And, and it just, you know, if this is what we have to work with, with limited people in the building with, you know, I hate when AEW puts their actual stars out there. They've got the highest paid audience in the history of professional wrestling. Yes. Some of those people need to be in the fucking seats instead of the ring, but don't put your stars out there, but you know, just people, it, it works better for me anyway. Um, the Saturday night clash, actually, it wasn't even head to head. If you wanted to, it was like the old days. You could switch over from one promotion to another. It's just, unfortunately the fun of the old days with both promotions being good is fucking gone. But, um, we'll go with takeover first which was the second half of the block of wrestling that night. Uh, and the, they opened with a nice match, Finn Balor, Timothy Thatcher. And these guys are a perfect style blend to do what both of them do best and what they wanted to do with this. They worked a contest. It was all grappling at first. And then Finn started a little rough stuff. He's just so fucking smooth. But you know what I was thinking here at this point? Something that looks like sport or contest is now out of place on the wrestling shows. And it, this, it, this was so well done. It was for the purists. Uh, in the old days, you know, the purists liked to see Billy Robinson and Tony Charles on the card, but, you know, Dusty or Eddie Graham or whatever was the main event. But it, it seems like now either it's all bullshit or all wrestling. It, is anybody actually bl blending the well I know the answer to this Pat McAfee and Adam Cole as we'll talk about in a minute but is anybody actually blending wrestling and bullshit to come up with the pro wrestling that we fucking like for a hundred years it's either all the way in one direction or all the way in the other have you noticed this have you heard about this yeah I've noticed it <laughs> did Finn Balor ever work with Benoit no, I don't think so. Cause uh, no, timing wise, I, I, I would timing, be. Very how surprised. long has that been? Oh my God, that's been too long, boy. Yeah, Finn Balor and Dynamite Kid in his day. If we get a time machine, that would have been interesting. Finn Balor but and he, Tiger Mask. Finn Balor and Tiger, but he would have been probably Tiger Mask. Fuck! If if Tiger Mask was around today, Finn Balor would have been Dynamite. He would have been the guy they they would have wanted to to work with him anyway. Uh, they had a they had a nice wrestling match and Balor hit his double foot stomp off the top, which God damn, I don't know what I'd want to lay there for. 
and hit his DDT one, two, three. A lot of, I feel like I like watching these matches, but I almost think that it gives the play wrestler, everything's supposed to be silly and fun fan, um, ammunition to, well, well, that's boring because you have to actually know what the fuck they're doing and be a fan of the, the actual business and the sport to, it's not just watching people just go out and do gymnastics routines. So anyway. What did you think of that particular contest? I thought it was good. I thought it was a good opener. I've really liked Finn Bauer in NXT. He's he's someone that you look at and, and he seems serious. And that stands out because so many people don't seem yeah. serious. They seem like they're doing a routine. He seems believable, even though he's a smaller guy. I do question what they're doing with Thatcher because he got that big win over Matt Riddle. And then I feel like we've seen him do nothing but lose on TV ever since he does those vignettes showing people moves. But then he never gets a big victory. Well, maybe he's he's one of those guys he can't do, but he can teach. <laughs> I don't know. I think anyway. he could do. I think there's something they could do with him. But, I mean, we'll see. Time will tell. No, I was kidding. I think there is, too. He's, he's a good old-fashioned fucking pug-faced. You know, he, he reminds me in the face of a guy like Tom Lawler. It's got those big taxi cab ears and fucking crooked teeth and everything because he's a fighter. But... Anyway, I, this surprised me. They put the ladder match, the five-way ladder match for the North American title on second, it, which was Damian Priest versus Johnny Sameface versus Bronson Reed versus Cameron Grimes versus Velveteen Dream. You're laughing. What did I say? Johnny Sameface. Oh, yeah, Gargano to his friends. Um, everybody in this match has a different gimmick and look build everything it, this was unusual today in that these days and that everybody stood out as different in a fucking match and i like bronson reed i love damian priest i like cameron grimes i wish this was an elimination match right at the top of it i wrote i wish this was an elimination match so at some point you could really get into it when it's either two against one or one on one but it's not going to be that way. It's a five way and everybody just does stuff and you just watch for the spots. So you can never rate these matches very fucking high. And plus it's a five way and a ladder match. So you put a hat on a hat and weren't ladder matches so much better when there was one fucking ladder instead then now there's 15 fucking ladders everywhere. It was better when there was, Two guys in the match. Well, two guys in the match and one fucking ladder. Yeah. But, uh, um, I, I, just uh, random notes. Uh, Bronson Reed and Damian Priest are going to be main event main roster guys. It, 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 unless they fuck them up on purpose or somebody gets badly injured, both those guys are going to be big deals on the main roster. Uh, Johnny Sameface did a little out of place. Ha ha. Um, they did the spot where everybody got sandwiched in the corner with the ladders and et cetera. And I, about this time with all the ladders laying around and people staggering around, it started lagging. And then they did the fucking contrived five way superplex combo off the top rope where everybody took a bump at the same time. And that lost me. Cause it's just, it's just ridiculous. It's it's the same thing they do in all these multi-man matches. Now it's not novel and it takes so much cooperation. You just can't look at that and go, Oh, this is accidentally happening. Um, everybody did shit to each other. Everybody got wiped out on the floor. Damien priest ran up the ladder and cannonballed everybody. Um, he's just, you know, he's got something he's natural in the way that he speaks and his facial expressions and everything. And then here we go. Even though this was a five-way, I like all these guys in the match, and I'm hoping one of two of them wins, either Reed or fucking Priest. I, I like Cameron Grimes, but I know what he's there for, and they're not going to put that on him. But then here comes Candice LeRae, and she just, out in front of the referee, where they now say, well, it's no disqualification. She jumps in to stop Cameron Grimes from, gri from griming, from climbing the ladder, starts slapping him around, then starts doing spots with the guys and she fucking joins hands with her boyfriend. That's the same size as she is and jumps up on the top rope and does an assisted hurricane Rana 
on to one of the guys and I said, okay, I'm fucking done. So I fast forwarded to the finish because these are supposedly the five best guys out of all these elimination matches that are going to go for the North American championship, the second most prestigious title in their organization that the, the champion just vacated in this, what is supposed to be the ladder match, one of the most dangerous matches in all of wrestling and a 120 pound fucking blonde girl or gray haired girl now is just going to fucking run in and immediately start fucking asserting her physical dominance and fucking flying around and just joins the club. So fuck you. If you're not going to be fucking serious about this thing, I'm not goddamn watching the rest of it. So I fast forwarded to the finish. Damian Priest kicked Johnny Gargano off the top of the fucking ladder and got the belt. Good choice of winner. Priest is going to be big. Bronson Reed's going to be big. Grimes is a great gimmick. If they'd have kept the fucking douchebag out of the goddamn match, I would have watched the rest of it. What the fuck? Can they not be serious anywhere at any time? What'd you think? I'm not a big fan of these kind of matches in general. I think it makes even less sense when there's no real crowd there. You're doing all these big spots for no one to pop, you know, except for the yeah. trainees and the other wrestlers who are the, in attendance. I hated Candice LeRae getting involved. I'm not going to call her a douchebag, but I hated Candice LeRae getting involved. Um, The right guy won. I'll say that. If there's someone I'm going to elevate and put a belt on, over the last several weeks, Damian Priest has really won me over. I agree with you about his future potential on the main roster. There's a few guys there that I think have real potential on the main roster. Not necessarily in this match, but in NXT right now. Yeah, That's all I can really say. I'm not a fan of these ladder matches, these multi-person ladder matches in general. Well, I'm not a fan of multi-person matches in general, let alone multi-person ladder matches, because I feel like I've, seen, I've read this script before. You know, there's it's only the so same many ways thing. to do it. Yeah. And, 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 but yeah, besides that, the, the ladder matches, as you mentioned, take it, you can get seriously injured to this bullshit and there's no reason for it. No people there. And you're just whacking each other with fucking ladders. I don't know. Anyway, from the outhouse to the penthouse, next up was Adam Cole and Pat McAfee. And I admit that I have not understood why they got into this whole thing the way they did. I guess in in trying to figure it from every angle, the only match they wanted to have, the only match Pat McAfee wanted to have, the only match they trusted him to have was against Adam Cole, the best worker they got. I don't think they needed to be that fucking worried. It, it was a great match. I don't know. With the Undisputed Era being the top heel group, why did they switch the entire top heel group babyface for this one match? I'm not sure. Um, but that's what they did. So McAfee is a great heel. Adam Cole can do either. He's a great babyface and a great heel. Pat McAfee's a great heel. He's been the heel since the start of this. That's why I was confused. They couldn't have put him against a babyface. But this completed the fucking turn. It, 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 the Undisputed Era and Adam Cole were complete, clear baby this. So if that's what they're doing moving forward, then I'm fine with this because they'll be good at that too. But if it was just like we just became baby faces against this heel football player and now we're going to go back and try to get heat and beat up all the other baby faces, I don't know what sense this made. But, but I guess we shouldn't argue because we got this match out of it. Um... Pat McAfee is a great fucking heel. He is uh, talking, working facially. Uh, and they were actually working. But if, when you hear us talk about working instead of wrestling or working instead of doing spots or whatever, this is what working means. They clearly told a story. Who was the baby face? Who are we supposed to root for? Who's the heel? Who are we supposed to fucking boo and root against? The match made sense. They play. Uh, Pat McAfee showed that he was an athlete. He's a pro football player, and he's a heck of an athlete. But Adam Cole was a little smarter when it came to wrestling in the end. Blah, blah, blah. Great story. Um, 
Is it the dive? McAfee had to do a dive. That even worked because it wasn't so fucking obvious. Right. You know, it 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 was the guys were arguing with each other, and suddenly here comes this fucking maniac flying in. He made Ron Gronkowski look like a piece of dog shit. No, it was even better than that. The guys were arguing with each other, and then security came to separate everyone. Yeah. So no one is like facing the ring, looking at the ring, waiting for the guy to dive on them. Everyone is reasonably distracted. When out of nowhere, he does that dive. It was fantastic. Yeah. So well done. And a better dive than a lot of these fucking midgets. Um, we found out that Pat McAfee was once roommates with the Possum King. So we know that now. Uh, I can see Rip Rogers' training in uh, McAfee's punches and kicks especially. You can teach any athlete how to leapfrog. But McAfee, besides being a fan, knew what the fuck he was doing here. And Adam Cole sold like Ricky Morton and then made a great fighting comeback. Didn't do all the wrestling bullshit because he was mad. Uh, that, the McAfee, the backflip off the top, the leap up and the superplex, he looked like fucking Shelton Benjamin. And honestly, if he wanted to go completely legitimate, it, that was a little much that a football player should be able to do in his first match, but goddamn what an athlete, right? So... Uh, like when McAfee kicked the steps, it was a little off. I'd have preferred Adam's head be a little a different place where it looked like he was really trying to kick his head, but Adam got the figure four. I wrote, this is a pro wrestling match, exclamation point. McAfee, with a, like a heel should, kicked him in the balls. Uh, who put this together? They need an award. And then finally, fucking McAtee punted him. One, two, Adam kicked out. Good, he redeemed himself from getting beat with the kick before and then of course McAfee was still selling his his bad foot I would have rather Adam knocked him out with the knee rather than do that Panama sunrise thing because goddamn that requires so much cooperation I completely agree with you that was the only thing I didn't like was not just the finish but leading into the finish it was pretty obvious that they were getting set up for that that was the one thing in the match yeah. I didn't like if if when Adam had gone to pull the knee pad down and, and said, I want you to see me beat you, and then hit him with the knee, that'd have been perfect. But he has to wait for him to get up and bend over and stand there. And with with the atmosphere they had created where you could lose yourself in this thing and believe they were mad, I you know, I just thought, eh. But it was a great fucking match. Great debut match. Fucking wait a minute. McAfee, wherever you are, hold on here. Sounds about as real as the reaction on SmackDown. <laughs> well, <laughs> but anyway, but no, that was a that was a good fucking piece of business, and McAfee should be proud of himself. And it just now, once again, I want to see. Okay, are Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, and Roderick Strong now all baby faces, and they're going to interact with the other heels? Because if then they've done this for nothing and just taken heat off their heels. If if not. So that's the only thing I'm confused about. I want to see more Pat McAfee. I hope they find a way to keep him around and do something else with him. I know he's a busy guy and a successful guy, but hopefully they can throw some money at him. He proved himself. The promo he did before the match yeah. was fantastic. And I'm like, wow, this guy is a natural. He gets <laughs> how to be a heel. And then even during the match, his selling, he knew how to sell. Even when he kept doing things after hurting his foot, he kept selling the foot. It was perfect. Just imagine if there were actually fans there when he did the backflip off the top rope and then jumped up to the top rope in one jump. Oh, they would have, they gone would have out lost of their, their minds. So impressive. Next to Ronda Rousey, this may be the single best debut I've ever seen someone have. I really hope they find a way to keep him around and do more with him. Because in, in, you know, each week I started liking him more and more because I, at first I didn't really understand why they were doing things the way they were doing it. But once I saw his promo, I'm like, wow, this guy could do a promo. And then after seeing this, this guy is as much a natural as anyone. They really got to find a way to keep him around. He's, he's the best heel they have. Well, you know what? I just realized, you know what? You've just doomed him. He's doomed. You know why? Because all the fucking guys that are training at the performance center get in the ring and do what they do. and then. McAfee trained in a barn with Rip Rogers, and he does what he does. Yeah, what an so indictment! What an indictment of their performance center. Good. Well, wait a minute, Rip Rogers. He 
he he got in the ring and trained some other guys for him at one point, like Cena and Lesnar and Batista and Shelton and all those guys. Something not working with this equation. I don't know what. Anyway, so the next match, Brian, take it away. Dakota Kai and Io Shirai. This was a fantastic women's match on the NXT TakeOver show featuring world champion or NXT champion Io Shirai, a very talented Japanese female pro wrestler versus the extremely talented Dakota Kai with her giant bodyguard Diesel. I really liked this match. I thought it was really good. I actually thought Dakota Kai was going to win for a while. Best women's match I've seen in a while. I've really liked it. And Io Shirai won, and they set up a, I guess, a future feud now with Rhea Ripley and either Dakota Kai with her bodyguard or just the bodyguard with Rhea Ripley. It's nice to see they're doing something with Rhea. I don't know why they've dropped the ball so badly with Rhea Ripley since WrestleMania, but they've completely dropped the ball with Rhea Ripley. But if, if I have to sign up for Rhea Ripley versus Dakota Kai, I'll, I'll take that. I, I really, really like Dakota Kai. But what did you think? More importantly, you, the big fan of women's wrestling, what did you think of this match? Well, I'm glad you put more importantly in there, Brian Last, because it's always more important what I think than what anybody else thinks. And <laughs> what I thought was that I hit the fast forward button and I didn't let off of no! it until I, saw, until I saw Rhea Ripley. Oh, come on. What the fuck? And then when I saw Rhea Ripley, I said, oh, okay, let's see what she's going to do. And she had the stare down with Raquel Gonzalez. Can Gonzalez work? I don't know. We haven't seen enough of her yet, right? Um, have that's, we seen I'm, her? Have we ever seen her wrestle? I don't think we have. That's what I'm saying. We yeah. haven't seen to know whether she can, can work or not. But uh, but they're they're. It's actually perfect because Rhea's the baby face and Raquel Gonzalez has about a half an inch on her. Just enough, just enough to be a little bigger and a little meaner looking. I'm interested in that. We'll see where that goes. Why did you fast forward this one? Because I was running late and I've watched a lot of bad wrestling. Of all the women's matches on all three shows, as it turns out, that you watched, this was the one you shouldn't have fast forwarded. If Rhea Ripley wrestles, I'm going to watch. Dakota Kai's great. Io Shirai's great, too. Well, all right. I can't believe you fast-forwarded this. I'm so <sighs> disappointed. You sound disappointed. I, it was really good. I'm watching it like, oh, man. <laughs> Jim will not be able to deny this match. <laughs> this match is really good. Jim's going to go, you know what, Brian? I see it. Dakota Kai is a real talent. Io Shirai was really good. Both girls did a great job in this match. I really liked it. Instead, you know what? I got you know fast what? forward. Dakota Kai is a real talent. Oh, Io Shirai did really good get in this match. Here. These, here. these are wonderful performers. <laughs> oh. All right. The next match contains your favorite entrance. Keith Lee versus Karrion Cross for the NXT title. And by the way, I and I'm sorry, here's another thing. If they wanted me to watch the girls match, they should have put it on before Pat McAfee and Adam Cole. Because I was in the mood to quit while I was ahead after that one, because that's the best thing I've seen in a week or two. And But Keith Lee and Karrion Cross have both gotten our attention. I'm a big fan of Keith Lee. Remember I said last week he finally, he cut that promo, got mad, sounded like JYD from 1981, right? This match, he looked like JYD from 1987. Did I miss something here, or did they miss the fucking boat? Did Karrion Cross and Keith Lee, was this a style clash, or was, what the fuck happened here? Well, what did you think? You know, it's, it's weird that you say that. I, I, I'm not going to go as far as saying JYD 87. I think that's incredibly unfair. I'm kidding. But, you know, it started out like the first minute, 90 seconds. I was like, oh, wow, this is good. You know, this is kind of... There's something going on here. Big man match, slugfest. They're laying them in. And they completely, at that point, slowed it down and changed pace, and it really became about working a hold. And Karrion Cross, fantastic facial expressions. Yes. Really, really good. He's one of those guys, you want to talk about guys who will be a big star on the main roster? He's one of those guys. Because he has an interesting look, he's good in the ring, great facial expressions. Good size, in shape. I have more faith in them doing right by him than Keith Lee on the main roster. Just because I have a feeling they're going to screw up Keith Lee. But I don't know why this match was paced the way it was. 
And coming off the Pat McAfee. Match, I don't know if they're going to screw up Keith Lee or if Keith Lee's going to screw up Keith Lee, because I don't know if Keith Lee knows. Vince McMahon could very well be persuaded that Keith Lee does not know how to get himself over by the way that he is hit or missed the way he projects in the ring or in, in public. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I get putting your world title on last, but coming after the Pat McAfee match, which was so phenomenal, and the Dakota Kai match, which was really good, <laughs> this was a different pace. It took a while. It wasn't a quick match. I'm not saying it should have been, but like I said, the first 90 seconds were hot and heavy. Well, but think about this. Lee and, and Donovan Dijakovic, Dijak, whatever name he's using this week to stay ahead of the law, head of the law. Um, they went the same amount of time, but they did some shit. And I'm not talking about they need to do more shit. Now, Cor the Cornette, well, he doesn't want him to do shit, and then he does want him to do shit. It was the same thing. It was Keith Lee versus a big man, but it was not a style clash. It was, it was, they, they, they fit together. This did not work. It wasn't put together. I don't know what the fuck. <laughs> what, what hurt it for me at the start was after the fucking big man match, punch and kick and chop and meat, they went outside and did the walking around the ring, fighting on the floor forever while the referee pretends to count deal. Like, like Brody on an independent show when he just grabbed his opponent because that's a, the, the people wanted to see Brody fight around the arena. So he just grabbed the guy by the hair and walk him around the arena and throw a few punches every once in a while, make faces. That ju they just did this. I I like both these guys, but that just was like stuff everybody does, every independent match. And then when you like you said, when they went in the ring and start working a hold, Carry and Cross was getting holes that were either barely holes or not really holes at all. And it. it and I know, and doesn't he have an MMA background? So it's not like it, it just seemed like he just was having a problem with getting Keith Lee in the right place or what the fuck, but the chin locks or the arm holds, they weren't fucking holds a lot. They were barely on or not at all on or whatever. And then it, it, Keith Lee didn't seem like he had the spark. Um, it did the one thing where he, he blistered him. He was on his knees and then he grabbed his arm and dropped backward, did the kneeling divorce court thing. And Corey Graves, by the way, thank you, did my divorce court fucking line. Yeah, when Bobby that. Eaton started doing that, you know, yeah, boom, you call that the divorce court. It not only separates the shoulder, it divorces it. Uh, boom. But anyway, it just... Keith Lee was sluggish fighting from underneath. They didn't have their timing. They were trying to do Finn Balor and Timothy Thatcher stuff for a while. And then Keith Lee's comeback there toward the end was like they were both somed. And by a couple minutes later, like they were underwater. And it was not going to fucking end. And then, then you saw Cross took the bad bump on his right shoulder from the clothesline. And did you see the separation? What do you mean? You didn't see that fucking knot? Oh, I did not, no. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, well, in case, if anybody else watched it, go back and watch when Keith Lee hits Karrion Cross with a big clothesline, boom, late in the match. Cross takes a bump on his right shoulder, immediately grabs it, and he's selling it while they're laying there. And from that point on, he's not got full use of his right arm, and it started making me ill to my stomach when you separate your shoulder. And maybe this wasn't a full separation. I saw something on the internet said he wasn't going to miss time. I don't know how that's going to take place. But when you separate your shoulder, you have a knot on the point of the shoulder. And that never goes away. Even when it heals, you, uh, anytime you've separated a shoulder, you can tell the guys that have or had and you feel for the fucking knot, right? You can see that fucking knot. He can't use the right arm when he's trying to get holds. He's he's tucking it in when that power bomb Keith Lee gave him on that fucking shoulder must have been comfortable. But in various places, you will be able to see a knot on Cross's right shoulder or when he's moving his arm in a certain way, it looks like a fucking big dip where something's been torn out from under his shoulder skin. It's fucking nasty. So anyway, now he's fucking hurt. And he gutted through it, all due respect to him, but, but the finish, 
was rotten because it would have been a rotten finish anyway. They built up to where Cross couldn't give Lee the Saito suplex till finally he does off the turnbuckles, and that's a big bump, and that's what it... But it took forever up on the turnbuckles to set that up. Even with both guys healthy, it takes so long to set it up that it's just blah. It's just to take a big bump for no reason. When you can tell that each person is helping keep the other one up there, you've lost the fucking impact the bump makes. Uh, And then with his bad arm, but he got it. So, you know, respect to Cross for getting through it, but boom, Saito suplex off the turnbuckle. And and there you go. Uh, what did you think of the whole fucking nine yards? I thought the match was a letdown from whatever expectations I had for it, but especially coming after the previous two matches. I don't know what else to say. And I also, I guess it's the, the swan song for Keith Lee is going to Raw. Well, yeah, and here's the thing also. They fucking... They have the guy win both belts, give one up, and then lose the other one two weeks later. Yeah, it all happened pretty quick, didn't it? So, I, you know, but I now, you know what? I wonder, is Keith Lee one of those guys where the match is real good if he's going over, but match maybe ain't so good if he's not? I, who knows? Anyway, uh, Karrion Cross get well soon. That was fucking go back and look at that. Now it's fucking nasty. That knot on his shoulder. Anyway. Oh, you know what the problem is? I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is these guys aren't eating well enough, Brian. They're not eating. Are you sure that's the problem? One guy looks very, very healthy. And the other guy looks like he enjoys some food. No, they need to eat better. They need to eat better quality food. They need to eat Omaha steaks. Well, That's doesn't? exactly what these guys need to eat because they wouldn't be getting hurt like that if they were eating the good stuff from Omaha steaks. Folks, Omaha steaks has burgers, chicken, steaks, franks, incredible, incredible cuts of all types of meat delivered right to your door. The Grand Summer Grill-Out Package is the big star of this thing. That's the one we're talking about here lately. The Omaha Steaks Grand Summer Grill-Out Package is exactly what you need to keep you out of these summer doldrums. And for a limited time offer, folks, Omaha Steaks is offering a steakhouse grilling package just for my listeners. If you go to omahasteaks.com, enter the code JCE into the search bar this week. Omaha Steaks is going to add four burgers and four gourmet jumbo franks free with your order. So whether you're enjoying the bacon-wrapped filet mignon, the pork chops, the chicken, the kielbasa, whatever it is, all delivered to your door and free food just because you listen to this program. Brian, obviously, the height of the summer grilling season you're you're out there with just giant cuts of meat constantly grilling and sautéing and flambéing. You love these things, don't you? More grilling than sautéing, but yes, absolutely. What about I, the flambéing? I don't know about that, but I certainly love my Omaha steaks and this gives everyone out there a great opportunity. Be like the great Brian Last, have filet mignon several times a week. Oh, well. You might have just shot this sponsorship, be like the great Brian Last. <laughs> Folks, go to omahasteaks.com, type JCE in the search bar, and you can shop those summer grill packs today and get the four free Jumbo Franks, four Omaha Steak burgers to complete your steakhouse experience. They come flash frozen, vacuum sealed, safely delivered in a cooler with dry ice, fresher than fresh. Boom, right to the door. You'll be gnawing on cattle byproduct and more in no time at all with Omaha Steaks. That's right. The best thing to come from Omaha since Warren Buffett. I thought you were going to talk about one of the Dusicks or something. No, Warren Buffett. Berkshire Hathaway. Great stock. Well, anyway, I don't know enough about my... I I know his brother, Jimmy Buffett. That's not his brother. I've never met Warren. (laughs) Cheeseburger in paradise. All right, should we 
Should we also, uh, I must mention, wait a minute. I, as a matter of fact, I'm supposed to do this at the top of the program. Shit. What? What's wrong? Well, we, we talked about on the experience this past week. I said, hey, with all of the monkeying that's being going on with the post office, and they're trying to stop people from voting by mail or slow it down or cast aspersions on it because the dipshit's going to try to steal this thing because he knows he can't win it any other way. And I asked... Uh, members of the cult of Cornette, who you did not believe when I said they're smart people and they're going to do this research. You didn't believe it. You scoffed at it. Did I? Yes, you did. You were scoffing. I don't recall. Definitely scoffing. You were saying, oh, they're not going to go to that much trouble. You scoffed. Well, I, I'll have you know several people, <laughs> including several of the smart people that I'm, I said I wouldn't mention their names because if I left other people out, they'd be mad, did send in the information really quickly you can go to vote.org, O-R-G, or you can go to the U.S. Vote Foundation.org, or you can go to 538.com. Apparently, you can go to a lot of places and get all the info for voting in your state, absentee voting, mail-in voting, early voting, the whole nine yards, so don't let this piece of shit get away with this. Uh, we got to get him out of here while we're all still alive and have the ability to. So vote.org, 538.com, usvotefoundation.org, all these places will tell you where, whatever state you're in uh, where you can vote. And I'm also hearing, of, of course, U.S. citizens in territories like Puerto Rico and American Samoa can't vote for president. So we need to fucking get that shit cleared up. Because I'm pretty sure that Puerto Ricans are pretty sick of pig face. We need them. Well, you know, Jim, everyone in the country right now is worried about how this election's going to go, and they're hopeful that their vote will count. And they're already starting to seek legal representation in case their vote isn't counted, in case there's some kind of problem, in case they're turned away from the post office or the polls. They're looking for someone to call to help them out. I don't know if he covers any of this, but this is my attempt at a transition. Well, it failed miserably, but I'll tell you this, this <laughs> the same guy that can't do a tinker's dam about your vote getting fucked up can, can certainly help you if you're in, in trouble with some major corporation having uh, inferred upon your rights, someone having poisoned you or your environment, harmed your family through their negligence, greed, avarice, and uh, lack of empathy. I know one guy that can help you with that. Call Stephen P. News. If you need to sue. An outlaw mud show or two. To the rest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, unlike the great Brian last shitty segue, uh, I unless you have a problem with your voting, Stephen P. New can help you with almost everything else. And we've talked about it before. Go to newlawoffice.com or call 888-692-8084, but go to newlawoffice.com and look at the incredible array of cases that he is currently involved in or has been involved in in the past opioid addicted infants the town in west virginia that was given cancer and poisoned by an evil avaricious mining company the big pharmaceutical companies the big car companies whoever it is that has their lack of compassion for their fellow man and their negligence has caused harm stephen p new is the man that can get even for you if you need to sue call stephen p new get even with stephen 888-692-8084 and go to newlawoffice.com and look at the array of cases and all the people we've said it he's the mother Teresa of west virginia and you know what somebody then emailed me here not long ago and said you know mother Teresa was really a bitch and she did this net and, and the other thing what? so i'm going that's what he said who's that I don't fucking know. I never heard of the fucking guy, but he said Mother Teresa was a real fucking hag. So I'm going out on a limb right now and saying that apparently Stephen P. New is an even nicer human being and an even better friend to humanity than Mother Teresa. And boy, that's 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 pretty darn good. So 
888-692-8084. Call a man who will speak to you in a nicer way than Mother Teresa. The Mother Teresa of West Virginia. <laughs> you know, I, as a matter of fact, the first time I met Stephen, I went over there to West Virginia. I met Stephen. He said, let me introduce you to my wife and my sister. Problem was, there was only one woman standing there. But anyway. Oh, come on. Don't do that. Oh, no, nice. it's a, well, it was right out there in front of everybody. Oh, come on, Jimmy. Right out there waiting. That's not for right. Me. All right. Uh, should we talk about this other program? I think we have to. We had issues with this program, as we mentioned at the top of the program, this program. There's too many this program pronouns, pal. Okay, we mentioned at the top of this drive through episode that we had problems with the All Friends Wrestling program because of it was on the Turner Networks. Their sports ran over the basketball game. And this 6 o'clock show began at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, so our DVRs missed the last half hour. We had to catch up on it through unscrupulous means. And we're, obviously, there's no ratings war here. Their ratings are going to be off. We're not going to you know, uh, rag on them for their ratings. I don't know what they were. Have you even heard? It's, it's just been over the weekend. It was Saturday. I think there's a delay on Saturday ratings. Yeah. So uh, maybe later but, today or tomorrow. But it's not, you know, and this is, they don't get penalized for this because this ain't their regular time slot. Although it's going to end up being about a sixth or a seventh or an eighth of what the Saturday night 605 TBS show used to get back in the day. But they can't help it. They're doing good for now. Uh, But anyway, uh, the show opened very strangely for an unopposed show. They open up with all the pyro. There's plenty of room to blow off their time to blow off the pyro because Lord knows they paid for it. They blow off the pyro. FTR with Tully Blanchard and Private Party are already in the ring, and they just ring the bell with no introductions and go. And then they, when they start the match, then they put in a box replaying last week where... FTR pile drove Ricky after Ricky punched Tully and they explained that FTR was mad at Ricky for punching Tully because we couldn't ever figure out what the fuck happened last week because it all happened at the same time. So the announcers explained it, but all this was glommed together. This was lousy show formatting. Anybody watching this show if, if it came on at its schedule time of six o'clock, anybody watching it is a hardcore AEW fan. They didn't need to hook anybody. They weren't going to switch the fucking channel to another wrestling program because there wasn't any wrestling program on opposite them. So why couldn't they give these guys some entrances, B-roll the fucking incident from last week during the entrances, do an introduction, and then start the match? Because when they were doing the boxing shit, FTR had to fucking stall around to give the announcers and the, everybody time to do all of the shit to bring them up to date on the match. And by the time that they had actually started wrestling in earnest, they could have done it all the way I just said, and it would have made more sense. Does that make any sense? It makes perfect sense. Tony Khan doesn't know how to format a show. But the other thing is a few weeks back when they signed their contract, they have Arn Anderson with them. There was the angle last week. But it wasn't like they left the ring and they said, we're going with Tully. And then just all of a sudden, they're with Tully. Like, AEW does such a bad job of leaving out details for anything. It's just the next week's show, something's there, and you're supposed to, I guess, make assumptions as to how it went from A to B. But they never actually show you or explain to you or tell you what exactly happened. How did Tully end up in the corner with FTR? It's never really explained. Well, there's a, there's an interview with them later on. So, and it it still didn't quite explain it, which we'll get to, but, but at least they put, they put an interview on there, even though that's like reading the forward before you start chapter one. But anyway, as far as this match, FTR versus private party, this is why you need well-trained veterans to lead guys. Cause we've been saying since we started watching this fucking thing, Private Party has lots of potential. They're great athletes, especially Mark Quinn. Does some amazing things, gets the hang time. He has a magnetic charisma. You like to watch him. But they're sloppy. They're green. 
they they go too fast and their matches don't make sense. That, that could be said about a lot of, you know, green wrestlers. But FTR slowed them down, led them. The match made sense. It was the best match that Private Party, I think, has had. It wasn't great for FTR. It was good for FTR. It was great for Private Party because they had somebody, not only just an agent, lay. I don't even know if the agents even lay these matches out. I don't know how you possibly could lay one of these things out. Uh, not the FTR matches, the normal matches they have. But it, 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 with somebody actually in the ring saying, no, whoa, slow down or do this or do that or come here or whatever. And FTR, obviously, because they went through the NXT program, they're the best trained guys in the company, pretty much. Um, and he could work. I mean, to be fair, I didn't see too much Cash Wheeler before NXT. But Dax knows how to work. I mean, he was a uh, he was pretty yeah. good before he got to NXT. Cash is looking more like an Anderson brother every day, though. His shit, he's got some good shit. No, he's really good, and he's in great shape. And you know, a lot of people give Dax a lot of credit, and he deserves it because he's one of the best workers in the business. Cash is pretty damn good too. Well, that's why they're a good team. And the point is, okay, this perfect match. FTR are the heels. They have a manager. They got heat on Mark Quinn, the babyface. They kept him uh, cut off from his partner. And they got heat on him. So you had sympathy on the babyface. The heels are, are fucking uh, 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 dominating him. They have a manager. They're acting in a way that they don't particularly care about the rules. Everybody's in the right spot. I guarantee you the next week, they're going to book FTR against some heels and private party against some babyfaces. And, and screw up all the work they've done. Uh, but that's that's another reason they can't get their guys over, is they, they fall into this every once in a while, but as a rule, there's no clear babyface heel lines, and without that, you're not going to get anybody over strong. Uh, FTR did some nice teamwork on Mark Quinn's hope spots, kept him alive. It was a rotten hot tag, because the heels were nowhere near him, and Cassidy on his comeback, it was a little fast and he had some happy feet. But Oak, okay, it was a nice false finish when they tagged Mark Quinn back in. Um, I can't remember exactly how they went into it, but they were doing some good shit, different. You tell FTR thinks about this. Nice teamwork with the leapfrogs and everything into that spine buster that was pretty. Here's a criticism. Everybody now's doing this though. After the babyface comeback. The match still continues on and on and on. Unless when your babyface makes his comeback, unless you're going to fucking cut him off and get some heat on him too and give the other one his comeback, once the babyface made his comeback, your clock is ticking and your welcome is, is running out. Go into your shit and then get the finish done. Um, Tully interfered, jerked his man out of the way, so Cassidy crashed and burned, and FTR hit their finish. One, two, three, an actual wrestling match on All Friends Wrestling. I don't know what to make of it. It was it was a great tag. That was a great tag team match, great way to open up the show. You would actually think that this is a program that is serious and has a lot of talent on it when they do stuff like this in the first segment. That's what I got to say about that. Uh, and then Stone Cold Steve Moxley was in a storage room. Do they ever let him out in public? He's in the basement. He's in the broom closet. He's in the storage room. He's in a parking lot. He's in front of a fence. <laughs> what the fuck? Just put him in front of a goddamn backdrop. It's television. Do we need to see the fucking plumbing room of every arena? Just because that's where Moxley likes to hang out and mope? He's a big Mankind fan. That's where Mankind used to hang out. In the bowels of the building. Vince used to do that just so we would say, uh, where do you want to put ba Mankind, Vince, in the bowels of the building? He loved bowels of the building. I'm not surprised. Anyway. Uh, the MJF campaign segment was next. And... <sighs> He started off good, and I love he won't be able to play with his future children because of the DDT, and he wants to ban the DDT, and he was almost getting tears. And then 
His attorney, Mark Sterling. Mark Sterling, I know him from somewhere. He has been to one of the seminars that I was involved in, a ring of honor or some I, point is, and he's probably going to hear this now and go, God damn, he doesn't remember me instantly. But no, I point is his, his attorney, Mark Sterling did a great promo. And it, under any other circumstances of watching this program, I would have wanted to hear it, but not while he's talking and MJF is not. What'd you think? Let me start by saying I think MJF is a real talent. Great facial expressions from him. But other than that, I hated this segment. I do not like the way MJF's been used lately. I thought this segment was particularly bad. I thought you want to give MJF an attorney character and have him talk. If you want to do that, have it be someone who doesn't sound like he's acting like an attorney character. Yeah. I did not buy his promo. I know a lot of people get a kick out of the smiling girl standing there. To me, this is, I don't know if I should say it passes the raw test or it fails the raw test. I'm not which, sure which, which, which is passing and failing. Yeah. yeah. But this is a raw segment. I really don't like it. I didn't like the idea that Moxley got his hands on MJF before the match. I think that's a massive mistake. They should let MJF just build heat and build heat and build heat. And then See, it, this, this took it into ha-ha anyway, even though nobody was beating him up. It's 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 too ha-ha for yeah. the title match angle. No, I, I really, I think this is the wrong way to use MJF, who is someone I am incredibly high on. You can't find an episode of The Experience where we reviewed AEW, where I don't talk about how I think he's just one of the great talents in the business. This is the exact wrong way to use him. And I hated this segment. I have not liked this campaign stuff, but this specific segment, I just thought fit perfectly on Monday Night Raw, and I yeah. really didn't like it. And uh, I feel bad saying that because I really like MJF, and I think he's a great talent. Well, I said it before, I would put the title on him. I would have him beat Moxley and then eventually build to him against Adam Page in the long run. But I do not like what they're doing with him the last several weeks. Part of the reason I didn't like this segment because there wasn't any MJF in the MJF segment. And and like you said, it's it's just it's it's ha ha. We've said in the past, Jim. I have MJF is kind of bulletproof, and that he can get some kind of heat out of anything, and he can be a weasel in a chicken shed or whatever. He can find the but no, just making it like he's not. They have made it now with this segment like he's not serious about being him. That he's yanking our chain. It's gone too far. He needs to to pull it back just a little bit so that we believe that he's being himself instead of, instead of acting like himself anyway. But with that said, what followed that fucking segment made that segment look like the greatest angle in history of wrestling. They've got to have these multiple man matches. Dino douche, I'm sorry, it's Dino Douche. Did we settle on Dino Douche? I think we settled on Dino Douche, yeah. Dino Douche, QT Marshall, Dustin Rhodes, and Jungle Boy with the dwarf in the corner against the Vic Tayback Express and the Lucha Brothers. Now, at least everybody's heels and baby faces in this one, but uh, unfortunately, it's some of the heels and baby faces because we, within 30 seconds of this match starting, it was a complete mess and made absolutely no sense. Unlike the FTR match that we just saw where everybody can see how to have a match, just do the shit they do. Just do shit they do. But no. Uh, we used to call it scrambled eggs. That's what I wrote down, scrambled eggs. That's what you used to call it, just a fucking match where the baby faces couldn't be controlled, everybody got lost, and it made no sense. Whenever Dustin got in, he was the best worker in the company. But we've we've seen all of this shit that all these guys do. We've seen everything that the Lucha Brothers have to do, same thing every time, and blah, blah, blah. They got some heat on Dustin and went through a break, got some heat on Dustin, and after all the heat on Dustin, they made almost simultaneous iceberg cold tags. Just bing, bing, just like that, boom. And so what's the use of getting heat on somebody? 
So then here comes Dino Douche, and he made the same awkward comeback that that he usually makes. Nobody fed for this one. He came in and nobody fed him. He knocked the one guy down, hit the other guy on the apron, and then started trying to do his awkward show. Oh, and then Jungle Boy ran in and completely he he ran past Dino Douche and made a dive out of out to the floor onto the guy that Dino Douche had just knocked out there and completely missed the guy. And and then he did another uh, two more dives. The best thing about Dino Douche's comeback was Jungle Boy, because he stepped all over it. But Dino Douche was fucking everything up because he's so fucking awkward and he doesn't know how to make a big man comeback. He's got to make his goddamn ballet dancer pirouettes and awkward fucking strikes. So then, did you see Dino Douche give one of the Lucha Brothers the lowest choke slam in history? followed by a standing backflip for no reason to get a two count. He takes a guy that's a foot shorter and a fucking 80 pounds lighter than he is, gives him the lowest choke slam ever, and then instead of just covering him and hooking his leg, he, he turns his back on him, stands and does a backflip onto him, and can't beat him. Uh, then Dino and the Butcher did the sloppy big man stuff. Then everybody else came in and did everything to each other one at a time over and over. And then they all disappeared again out on the floor where they wait until their next spot. Then one of the Lucha brothers, and I believe it was the Baker argued with each other for some reason when they were about ready to put jungle boy away. I couldn't tell if it was that I want the pin. No, I want the pin because they didn't project it properly. And the announcers really didn't, but anyway, while they were arguing, Jungle Boy rolled up the Baker one, two, three. I wrote, who comes up with these matches and finishes and what kind of drugs are they all on that this sounds like it makes sense? White Claw. Then give me some fucking White Claw. No, I don't know. Uh, no. you're, you're a man. It's a woman's well, I just How could this, like I said, I can't imagine they have an agent, whoever their agents are, any veteran could not have put this match together because no veteran would envision that all these things would consist of a match. So they're letting the guys do their own fucking match. And, but somebody has got to come up with a finish. I don't know how that this is being presented as sounding like something that anybody should do, much less the people are agreeing to do it. I, 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 I don't know. Anyway, and then they're arguing, the heels are arguing, and Eddie Kingston comes out and cuts a promo to keep the heels from fighting each other. And he actually made these guys some somewhat interesting, but it's a new fucking group. They don't have any groups, thankfully. So we've got a group now, a new group. <laughs> of And I don't, I don't know. I'd rather see Eddie Kingston. Did I miss anything there? I don't think so. Luchasaurus exposes himself each and every week. I know he got really over at the beginning of AEW with the crowds, but the more I see of him, the more I'm convinced he has no idea what he's doing or why he's doing it. Well, that that's what the, the crowds because of his look and when he'd do something would cheer. But I think honestly, after seeing him all this time, when the crowds come back, whenever that is, they will be less into him because the more you see of him, the less you want to. I, I thought, wow, he looks like a fucking million dollars. But goddamn, every time I see him do something, I'm like, fuck, yeah, dirty, green, and wrinkled. That's a very forgiving crowd, so we'll see. And I don't want to see any more of those kicks, just enough of it. But I think off the top of my head, and I know there's the women's tag match coming up, but I think this may have been the worst thing on Saturday Night Wrestling between TakeOver and AEW. I hate these multi-person matches, and they keep doing them. Not just AEW, but everyone just... Let's get everyone on the show. Let's do this multi-person match, which will be a train wreck and a mess and not very good. I hope they don't blow it and waste Eddie Kingston, who is a phenomenal promo. He sounds legit. And I actually like him in the ring because he's different. I hope they don't waste Eddie Kingston aligning him with the Butcher and the Blade, who had a fantastic AEW debut. They came up through the ring. <laughs> and have been used like job guys ever since. <laughs> and the Lucha Brothers, who I'm personally not a fan of, 
They were last in a group with Pac. Pac can't come back into the country because of COVID-19. But I would keep Eddie Kingston all by himself and make him a guy in the singles division you could do something with. Yeah. I hope they don't blow it with Eddie Kingston. And I thought they was- figure they probably figure, well, he can talk and the Lucha Brothers can't talk and the Butcher and the Baker can't talk. I'm sorry, the meat gentleman and the fishmonger. But I thought this was the worst match. No. Well, look, the ta- the women's tag match is another thing. If you didn't fast forward past that, I'm going to. No, 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 no. I fast forwarded. But no, that was not the we haven't come to the worst thing of all these shows yet. Hold on. OK, don't get antsy. OK, OK. Uh, Britt Baker did a great promo. I am. She is fucking growing on me because she's so natural at being such an obnoxious bitch now. And also with the girls, there can be a little ha ha because let's face it. We're not talking about 275 pound men bashing a shit out of each other and trying to pluck each other's eyes out. There can be a little ha ha with the girls and she's a good heel. I don't understand why Penelope Ford is now gray haired and looks 50 years old. Um, I did know. Did you notice that Reba, the makeup girl has two inches and 20 pounds on old Kip Sabian, the fucking King of middle school. You hate fucking him. hell. It just, it's just, what the fuck? If he came up on the street, you'd be, you know, you'd be like, well, little fella, can I call, you know, so your parents to have him come pick you up anyway? I mean, he's, he doesn't weigh a lot, but how tall is he? I don't think he's as short as you think. Not very. Well, he was the same height as fucking Penelope Ford. And I, and it looked like Reba had an inch or two on him. I don't know. Anyway, it's rebel, by the way, not Reba. You're doing what Britt Baker does. I know, because that's the fucking deal. She's the best part of the goddamn whole thing. She's the one. They're, they're trying to make MJF smiling girl flunky into Reba. Reba's doing a good job. Was anyway, she the one in that match. Am I thinking of the right person? Was it Rebel in that match with Shelly Martinez? It was like the worst match in DNA history where. Shelly kept yelling, my vag, my vag. Oh, my God. <laughs> I remember I remember seeing that. I don't I don't know that uh, I've met Rebel a few times. She's a, a wonderful lady. But uh, but anyway, Tony Schiavone was up next with my little dog pockets. Fuck Taylor and my son, Trent. That's what he is now. Since he has no last name, my son, Trent, because his mother is now more over than he is. Um, is Tony Schiavone having trouble with his voice? It often sounds weak or he sounds hoarse or whatever, or is it, he has six jobs. I don't know how much broadcasting he does. I think it's age. I just think he's an older version of Tony Schiavone. He's like two or three years older than me. I don't sound fucking weak. Do I? No, but like, look at Vince McMahon, compare his voice to what it sounded like 10 years ago. Well, yeah, true. But anyway, I hope Tony takes care of his voice. So, of course, Pockets didn't speak and Jericho interrupted. And at this point, did you see Chris Jericho trying, 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 needing worse than a sick man needs penicillin to try to verbally get Pockets over to explain him dignifying Pockets' existence by working with him and act like that he was right to do it, to dignify this Cretan's existence. Well, you have proven to everybody, and you have to. No, you haven't. Only in, apparently, Chris's mind and the bubble of the AEW fan base thinks that this fucking clown has somehow proven himself to be a top guy or a main event guy. He's proven himself to be the classic example of a fucking make a wish come to life in the middle of a fucking wrestling ring. He has a stupid gimmick, no look whatsoever. And he's a complete embarrassment to the profession. Every time you see him, but he has been hired by a billionaire, a son of a billionaire, son of a billionaire who, who gets a tickle out of his gimmick and dresses like him at Halloween. And he is somehow through mass hypnosis become the male version of Sable where absolutely bereft of any talent for anything whatsoever. People started cheering for him because it was goofy and odd. And then he has a legitimate mainstream wrestling superstar who is for some reason so hungry, so anxious to be accepted by this fucking 
subgenre of fucking goofy cool kids that he has dignified this fucking guy by not only working with him but putting him over and then he was out there verbally trying to instill on the viewers who were going what the fuck this is Chris Jericho talking about some guy that changed my oil at the fucking shell station he was trying as hard as he could verbally to instead of tearing him down to get him over while still knocking him like a heel and it didn't fucking work and then he challenged pockets to the rubber match the mimosa mayhem match where they're going to pour 80 gallons orange juice and fucking 500 bottles of champagne into a tub. And they played a comedy dramatic spot explaining the rules of this, where you can win by pin submission or being tossed in the tub of mimosas. And of course, pockets without speaking accepts the challenge with a thumbs up. At first, I thought this was sad for Chris because he is clinging on to this goof because he's cool for 10 minutes. Then I started thinking, no, because Chris was already over and he didn't need this. And so I'm not really sad for him. Then I'm thinking if I was Tony Khan, perish the thought, except for the, all the fucking money, I'd, that's the only reason I'd want to be him. I bought for probably several million dollars the closest thing I could get to a big WWE star to come and be my the the fucking guy, the flagship of my program and he is now introducing comedy spots about working with preliminary job talent in a match where you got to get dumped into a vat of orange juice. If Tony Khan had any sense, he'd be he'd be madder than a goddamn green hornet about how he's getting fucked out of his money. He, he likes bought, this. He he's not Chris. getting fucked. He likes this. He, he's getting fucked. He may like getting fucked, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he's getting fucked. He bought Chris Jericho, and he's getting a fucking clown that's playing with a fucking job guy in a fucking tub of orange juice. He bought a main event star, a WWF superstar, a worldwide known name. And he's got a guy that's diddling his dick in a fucking tub of orange juice with a fucking guy with his hands in his pockets playing pocket pool himself. Then the inner circle jumped pockets and his best friends, and this was the most horrible, weak, sloppy brawling they don't even try anymore. Go back and look at some of the punches that are being thrown and just the overall, just by the numbers of this. And then Jericho hit the Judas on pockets and they poured champagne in his face while holding him upside down as Jim Ross had the line of the night. Can we get somebody out here, a referee, a hall monitor, anybody? A hall monitor needed to break up a fight between the fucking top heel and the fucking aspiring baby face. They're headed toward their rubber match. They need a hall monitor. This program is being booked by and for people who were bullied and picked on in fucking high school. So, but you say, what is worse than the match you said was the worst match? You know, I was going to say, Jim, there is a growing movement right now. I don't know if you've heard about this. There are so many people turned off to Chris Jericho that whenever his music hits, they want to stick earbuds in their ear and listen to something else. They you do know not what? want to hear any more Fozzy. I smell what you're cooking and I understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. Anytime that you hear Chris Jericho speaking about my little dog pockets, you can cancel that sound right away, ladies and gentlemen. Anytime you hear any of this verbal noise from any of these people in AEW and you want to shut it out, go to the Raycon earbuds. Folks, the Raycon earbuds, we've talked about them. They're half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, and they sound just as amazing. The newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, they're best ones yet. Six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, a more compact design. They stick right in your ears. They're not like the bugs that get stuck in your ears and you have to go to the doctor to get them out. They come right out when you want them to, but they cancel out all the noise. As a matter of fact, 
Stacy's driving me crazy. You know, I gave her my earbuds because I don't use earbuds because I don't use a cell phone or any other fucking technology. However, she loves them and she does. She's been going around the house for the last week, especially talking to her mother on the daggum Raycon earbuds, but I can't see a phone in her hand. I can't see anything in her ear. Her hair is over her ears. So I think she's talking to me and she's asking me some strange questions. As a matter of fact, I said, shouldn't you ask your mother about that? And she said, I am. That's when I realized she's wearing the Raycons. But folks, now is the time to buy the latest and greatest from Raycon and save money at the same time. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. If you'd slash JCE, you get 15% off. A lot of people would slash me for free, but you can get 15% off the Raycon wireless earbuds. They sound great, whether it's music, whether it's telephone, whether you're getting radio signals from NASA, whatever. It'll sound better with Raycon wireless earbuds. They're game changers, Brian. They are. And that last segment was a channel changer. Well, no, the channel changer is coming up next. Uh, we have suffered through some stinky outlaw wrestling on this program so far, but next up another multiple man outing. The dork order sends three masked children to face the elite road warrior and balding buck and their tag team partner, Kenny Olivier. And what an annoying song they come out to. That has to be. Yeah. The yeah. we're elite or what is it? Be elite or the elite. I don't even know if they're saying B or the. Whatever I thought it, it was. I thought it was one of our other sponsors, Beat Elite. But <laughs> maybe them. But Beat Elite. Yeah, it's it's an it's, it's a, awful. It's a kids' playground shit. But did you notice one thing? Was Kenny Olivier not announced recently at two hundred and two pounds? Did I hear that with my own ears? I don't recall. Recently, he was announced at two hundred and two pounds, and also. I've been talking about how the guys are not grown adult men and they could have, you know, the guy they announced at 199, they could have said 202 just to make it, you know, sound something, right? I think they're listening. Well, I, we know they're listening. Road Warrior Buck, his brother Balding Buck, and Kenny Olivier were ad, were announced at a total weight of 614 pounds. So let's say that Kenny Olivier weighs 202. That leaves 412 pounds. You mean to tell me they expect us to believe the Bucks weigh 206 apiece? If the Bucks are 206 apiece, then that means that Olivier does weigh 202 pounds. However, I think the Bucks are 180 pounds apiece, which means that Kenny Olivier weighs 254 pounds. Just food for thought. Anyway, um, the dork order had the three masked children of, you know, it, it's, they, they, they couldn't even spring for the matching ninja outfits like the other channel did. They just all wear different shit. As long as it's a black mask, one's got trunks, one's got tights. One puts a mask on when he comes out. If fucking idiots, uh, a gymnastics routine suddenly broke out as usual. They did some small children playing wrestler things while the referee stood and watched there was no flow, no timing, no story, no contest. Olivier did sell a low blow, which I wouldn't have thought that would be that effective on him. But he did. Uh, then here's another thing. Did you see that they took Olivier out on the floor? The mass dipshits did. And they hit him with a, a pretty safe but good-looking chair kick to the head deal where they put the chair in front of him and the other one run down and kicked the chair. And he took it good. He, he turned his head and, and took it with his shoulder and sold it well. And so, and and then instead of letting him sell that and that, red, wow, they just rung his bell with a chair. Then another one of the little mass goofs runs and puts the chair on his stomach and one of the other goofs runs down the apron and does a double stomp off the apron onto the chair on Olivier's stomach and, and fell ass first right on top of Olivier, right in his fucking belly. Just idiots. You've just hit the guy in the head with a chair. 
Let him sell it. Why are you doing a double stomp on the ch- on the guy on the chair that is contrived in its setup, looks phony, and looks like a potato because you fucked it up? Just idiots. Then they'd somehow it was they did a brain buster on the floor out of a fucked up dive thing onto Road Warrior Buck, and he wasn't even the legal man. But did you see that? However, the fuck the one had him up, and they fucking dove over, and they a brain buster on. The, they're literally risking their fucking lives for stupid shit for break spots that don't make sense and nobody's even going to remember except that I wrote it down. That's why I remember it. And he wasn't even the legal guy. And they went to the, that was just to put him down on the floor for a while. So he could come in later on and beat everybody up. As a matter of fact, we come back from the break and balding buck is making a comeback doing the same shit that he always does. And road warrior buck is fine after less than four minutes earlier being crippled. Um, Having these microscopic, indistinct, masked jobbers makes this program look... The NWA show on YouTube from the studio looked like network television compared to this fucking show just because of the goddamn outlaw-looking talent. Just outlaw, just low-budget, low-rent, indie outlaw look. So then... Three job guys in the dork order that are in on this team hit Kenny Olivier with seven strikes in a rows, in knees or kicks or whatever. Plus, he took two turnbuckles. So he took two turnbuckles and seven strikes in quick succession before he took one bump, and that was on a German suplex where he had no choice. And then after they did all that to him, he turned around and made his own comeback on all three heels, including hitting them with his fucking, what are they? The Petunia suplexes, the Snapdragons. The Snapdragon suplex, he made his own comeback and then hit, I thought an iceberg tag took place in the previous match. This was a frozen tag. He was hit umpteen times a quick succession took one bump, was right back up, made his own comeback, then dropped down on his knees, just reached out and tagged the fucking, and did finger pointing and jazz hands right before he did that and tagged one of the bucks. And then somehow both he, the, the heel group tombstone pile drove both of the young bucks. One of them took a tombstone and the other one he tombstoned on top of the buck which didn't look as good as a regular tombstone. And then another one of the jobbers missed the double stomp and landed ass first on Road Warrior Buck again. He missed, he went over him on the double, his feet landed on the the mat and his ass went into, the the announcers had to call it a Ray Stevens bombs away. Uh, Then a guy backflipped off the top rope for no reason because he wouldn't have hit anybody in the fucking ring. If, if if he had not been foiled by whatever the fuck they were, he wouldn't have hit anybody anyway. And then Olivier finally hits the one-winged fairy on one of the job guys, one, two, three. And that, honestly, well, I ain't got to the, to the best part yet. Then, now that the baby faces have won, Olivier, one of the baby faces, goes to powerbomb one of the job guys on a fucking chair. And the announcer is talking. He snapped, and he's going to kill this guy. What? Nothing happens to make him mad. He doesn't... Nothing happens in these matches that doesn't happen in every other match, but suddenly he's berserking beside himself. But he doesn't show being mad. He doesn't portray it in his body language, or especially that mopey fucking Harpo Marx looking face of his. He just does the shit that they're talking about that he's flipping in the same zombified fucking state that he does everything. He's not snapping. He's just by rote doing what he's supposed to do. Cause that's what the finish called for. Um, and then they have to talk him down from snapping and going off and killing these people. If this is a heel turn, well, he's flopped so bad as a baby face. P- 
People wouldn't want to see this fucking guy if they were on a sinking ship and he was a fucking Coast Guard fucking officer. So now they're going to try to switch him heel and like he's nuts because I can, I can believe he's stupid, but not insane. And the people don't dislike him as a heel. They just don't like him. I'm not talking about the AEW zombies. I'm talking about anybody who has seen Kenny Omega on television, only on AEW, just heard about him when this program started. They don't like him because why would you? He talks like a simpering twit. He has no base in his voice or conviction about himself. He does stupid shit, makes funny faces in a fucking bizarre way. And he has done nothing for an average wrestling fan who had never heard of him before to go, well, that's the greatest wrestler in the world. Only the people who are clinging to his vacant jock such as Uncle Dave and the rest of them who just can't admit to being wrong and can't admit that, well, maybe it was the fact that he was working with New Japan's top talent and he's a decent athlete and doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground otherwise. They can't just come out and admit that. You got to speak English? You ain't going to get over, pal. Got to appeal to an American audience? You ain't going to get over, pal, because you're a twit. But anyway... I would have expected this match from a bunch of athletic kids in wrestling school playing in the ring before you smarten them up. So not for botches, because there's been a lot worse botches, but just for a match, I think this was probably the worst ever on their television. Oh, come on. I may be wrong. Come on, that's ridiculous. Just just for a just a garbage match that made no sense and did nothing for anybody. The worst get match anybody ever over. on the television. The worst match ever on I didn't, AEW. I didn't say not not for botches, for business. Just continuously with this fucking Dark Order thing that we're apparently not going to get rid of. They're, they're doubling down big. And then uh, Olivier, had his shoulder was bruised to fuck up. I don't know what the fuck they did to him. Maybe he came into the match like that. I didn't see at the start, but at the end, he was bruised up. Um, But this was rotten. Just rotten. It made no sense. It was just rotten. Tell me it wasn't rotten. Well, it wasn't for me. I'm not a fan of the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega style match. Omega, I've seen him have really good matches with other people. In AEW, I like that match he had with Pac. I always call him Pac, but Pac earlier this year. I did like the tag team match with him and Paige versus the Young Bucks. Best Young Bucks match I think I've ever seen. In general, I'm not a fan of, of his matches and what he does. At least he doesn't do the head shaking that much anymore like he used to. Oh, God, that was fucking rotten. That was ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, you know, I hope he whips it out at one point just to bring it back for one night. So I go well, you can, you can tell all of the people that got into the wrestling business for all the wrong reasons because their favorite wrestler was the Ultimate Warrior. As soon as somebody told me my favorite wrestler was the Ultimate Warrior, I used to ask that on the application, on the wrestling training seminars and just when people would come in OVW whatever who was your favorite wrestler when they said the ultimate warrior I knew they were doomed but when it comes to Omega being over I think this is one of the things people jump on you for because he is certainly over with everyone who watches AEW who's an AEW fan with everyone that had already seen him before and and was told that they should like him he's over with them yes he is so, I mean, that's the thing. You When you say he'll never get over, you're speaking about with people beyond the audience that he already had going into AEW? Is yes. Yeah, well, of course, yes. I mean, you know, if he squatted down in the ring and took a shit, those people, oh, wow, it's great. What a talent he is. He's an artist. What a performance. But for, like, normal people who expect wrestlers to look like wrestlers, act like wrestlers, wrestle and fucking not be just fucking twinkle toes fucking mcfinger bang no the people who like steve austin or the undertaker or rick flair or dusty Rhodes or fucking terry funk or any goddamn wrestler since the dawn of time this is the last person you would be a fan of so yeah he's got he's got that fucking a million give or take a little bit less what are they and and that's the more that regular people see him the more they would not like him i'm just saying Anyway, let's move on. Please. Um, Officer Barb Brady did the interview with FTR and Tully Blanchard. 
where he gave the participants in the gauntlet match next week and sounded like a science teacher doing it. What did you think of this interview before I say anything? I thought Marvez was awful. I think just it's confusing laying out the way he laid it out. Again, I like FTR with Tully, but the lack of explanation of how we got here and then Adam Page running in, I wasn't crazy but, about this. Well, thing. this whole Mar- thing, Marvez is specifically awful as a. Well, yeah, but I mean, and, and that's what you've got what you got. It is what it is. I'm not saying that could have been improved. Here's the problem. There was no producer in charge that wanted to tell Tully Blanchard to do something again. And that did damage to Tully Blanchard. If I had been producing this, I would have cut it off and started it over before Paige even got there. And like I know what you got with Marvez. So besides that, Tully flubbed his fucking thought right at the start and didn't recover properly. He was trying to make the point there's a big difference between almost the champions and the champions. Almost great and great. Go back and watch it. He flubbed it. He didn't get it. He was trying to get it back afterwards, and he got wordy trying to get it back. This was too long. It didn't paint anybody to their best verbal ability. The producer should have said, cut, Tully, say exactly what you were going to say, but say it like you were going to say it this time. There's a big difference between almost great and great, between almost great and the champion, and I am the difference between almost and there. It, it some force in his voice and then pitch it to the guys because then FTR, I think Dak spoke first, but it, Tully at least has, even though he flubbed all that up and, and went around his elbow to get to his wrist, he's got conviction in his voice. Dax wasn't really sure. I don't think what he was either. He wasn't sure in his content or in his delivery or it, he didn't believe in what he was going to say, or he was concentrating on it. Tully didn't really say what he thought he was going to say or whatever. Then page comes in. Yes, we know he's a fucking drunk, but if he had a fucking beer in his hand, 24 hours a day, he'd be in a goddamn self-induced coma. If he's going to interrupt a fucking interview on national television, he can put the fucking solo cup down and come in and say something, then go back to his drink. We don't need that much reinforcement. That's what makes shit look hokey. If you want everybody to know he's drunk when he walks in, when he opens his mouth, let him fucking burp and let goddamn FTR blink their eyes a couple times. You'll know he's been drinking. He can go on deliver his fucking news. It's stagey when he comes in with the cup. So this was nobody's best effort. It should have been reshot. There was no producer in fucking charge here that apparently wanted to tell Tully Blanchard cut Tully just do it again we've all heard that and it, it wouldn't have led to a fucking fist fight but it was meandering and confusing and too long and I wrote I would not have let this air who produced this everybody could have done better everybody in the in the fucking piece except for Marvez could have done better and does and should have had the opportunity to do it again and it wasn't live I refuse to believe they were live at 7.15 on Eastern on Saturday night. This was not, this obviously was a taped show, correct? Well, for one thing, yes, because God damn it came on 30 minutes late. So they could have redone it. Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. They don't, it's, you get more than one chance at the goddamn pre-tapes. That's why they're pre-tapes. Take advantage of that. Uh, Darby Allen versus Will Hobbs. Darby Allen introduced as the strange enigma. Here's a question for you, Brian. Last, aren't all enigmas strange? Inherently. Isn't that why they're enigmas? Inherently, yes. Inherently an enigma. Wait a minute. I'm going to, right now, the American Heritage 3rd Edition Dictionary. Enigma. Edward Nigma. Enigma. E-P, endure. That's what, to carry on through despite hardship. <laughs> to suffer patiently without yielding. We certainly endured those programs. All right. Enigma. I'm still trying to find it here. It's very small print. F G H I. There we go. Enigma. One that is puzzling, ambiguous, or inexplicable. That sounds strange to me. What is the definition of strange? Let's just look this up. Oh, come on. It's more it's more interesting than the goddamn wrestling program. Strange brew. Kill what's inside of you. Strange. 
out of the ordinary, unusual, or striking, exotic. Strange enigma. Anyway, he's fucking strange, and he's an enigma. I like this match. I like this match, and I cannot lie. I will tell you why. While others go 20 minutes, this one got right to the fucking point. Darby Allen's pissed off the way he's been treated. He jump-started this thing. Boom, Hobbs worked a, a big man style. Darby Allen took a big backdrop. That was as high as fucking Joe LaDuke used to fucking chuck Jerry Lawler. Um, I like Hobbs. He's green, but he's impressive. He, he, a great spine buster. And then Darby Allen makes a comeback and hits a coffin drop. One, two, three. It was a good match, what it should have been, and got something accomplished. Imagine that. Uh, would you care to comment on Hobbs versus Allen before we go to the afterbirth with Team Taz? No, I thought it was fine for what it was. I uh, I thought Will Hobbs showed a lot. Hopefully, he gets an opportunity to show more. And I was well, okay. wait a minute. What else do you want him to show? He was awfully skimpily dressed as it was. Oh, I mean, you know it was what I mean. Still, a, still basic cable. And before you even go to the next thing, I'll just say I enjoyed the uh, post match. Well, there you go. The post match. Uh. It, I like Taz. I didn't know where he was going with it. I thought they were introducing somebody else, but he introduces the newest member of team Taz and out comes Ricky Starks dressed as Darby Allen and with the face paint and everything Starks has a ton of personality and he cut the gloomy promo like Darby Allen making fun of him. I hate the world and everything so, so hard. If this was the only goofiness on this show, this kind of stuff, it wouldn't be goofy and it would get heat. It's just that there's just so little seriousness on the whole program. And you've got the stuff that's just blatantly funny and stupid, like the my little dog pockets and the fucking mimosa jugs or whatever, that when the heels do this ass off, prickish type, smart aleck bullshit, it gets heat when when that's the only goofiness on the program. I can't say it any other way, but when it's not, it becomes just another part of a goofy program. It's like when you got 12, seven feet guys, you got no giants. And But here's the thing. It ends up, Starks is cutting the promo, and then here comes Brian Cage in from behind Darby Allen in the ring and hits him with the fucking title belt. By the way, he's still the FTW champion, right? Old Brian Cage. I presume that that was the belt. Yeah. Boy, that's been really fucking made a huge thing of over the last few weeks. He got the belt the next week, wrestled for the title and fucking lost. And now he's got the fucking. Yeah. Anyway, did you notice this here again? And this happened. Who was it? It happened. I can't remember who the last person that did it. It's always on AEW. Cage comes in and Darby Allen turns around and Cage going to hit him with the belt and Darby Allen blocked it. He covered up. He put his hands up in front of it. I, I, Stacy was going back through the fucking uh, living room at that point. I said, watch this. Cause I was trying to some silver lining and watching all of this. I said, what this guy do wrong? She hadn't been in wrestling school in fucking 18 years. She said, well, he covered up a belt shot that I could do safely. The guy throws his hands up over his fucking face and he covers up like he's getting hit by the goddamn sledgehammer. But this is the guy that dives out of the ring over the top rope head first on the concrete floor on purpose. All these guys take all these bumps and all these fucking ridiculous risks and chances and they cover up on simple shit. I think, remember what it was it Jungle Boy or the fucking dwarf that MJF was going to punch and he ducked it? And they cover up for the belt shot. If if you don't know how to do a belt shot and a guy needs to cover up like that, then don't do the belt shot. Anyway, Starks then cut a vicious promo on Darby Allen's ass. And then they gut shotted him with the skateboard. And then Starks gave Darby Allen his own coffin drop. All this shit looked good. Here is my question. You know, they say Cornette's always got a problem with something. Yes, I do. These are the same things that I would be saying in the production meeting. Because apparently everybody else is just goddamn sitting there fucking taking their check and not bothering to bring any of this up. From the belt shot, 
to Starks coming in, cutting the promo on him, punking him out, pushing him around, pie-facing him, gut shot with the skateboard, coffin drop. No referees, no agents, no security, no friends of Darby Allen. It's either they come instantly, they never come at all, there's no consistency, there's no fucking sense of urgency about this, there's constant crimes being committed, and the only reason that those things get over as being, it's not, they don't get over by the announcers going, oh my God, here's what's happening. Like you said earlier, Terry Funk said, your announcer is the most important person on the show. The announcer is the salesman. When you go into the fucking car lot, the announcer is the salesman. If he knows all about the cars, more than you do about the cars, then he will be able to sell you a car. But if you're telling this fucking dipshit what he needs to know about cars, you're going to go find somebody else because you don't trust him because he don't know what he's fucking talking about. When the announcers are just, oh my God, this is terrible. You need visual backup. They don't have to pull them apart. They don't have to fucking stop the chaos, but they have to look like they're stopping it. Whether it be referees or security guards or then uh, agents or then finally baby faces, friends of this guy's and send them in stages. Don't send 12 out at a time. Send a couple, then a couple more. That way it's easier to play King of the Hill or to keep it away, but there has to be the sense of urgency that somebody is trying to do something to stop this fucking crime, or elsewise it's not a crime. If everybody in the bank is just standing there while it's getting robbed and nobody gives a shit, then it's not a crime. It's a loan. So anyway, and all the stuff they did was good, but they did three weeks worth of it. Why did they have to hit him in the head with the belt then gut shot him with the skateboard, and then hit him with the coffin drop after cutting vicious promos on him to his face. Well, to get heat, you say. Did they get a bunch more heat than they would if when Cage came in and hit him in the head with the belt, Starks had kneeled down over him, cut a fucking vicious promo on him, and slapped him in the face? No, not really. Because if you're talking about fucking things that are done to these people physically... Well, goddamn, every fucking week, everybody lives through shit that they should be hospitalized for, so we've taken that tool out of our toolbox. What about if Cage had come in and hit him with the belt, and then they gut-shotted him with the skateboard? Well, that would have been good, too, of too much. But then they got to also coffin drop him. What about if this time they hit him with the belt and cut the promo on him? Next week, while he was doing something, they fucking jumped him and gut-shotted him with the skateboard. And the following week after that, right when he got his hands on fucking Starks, Cage glommed him and planted him, and then fucking Starks hit him with the coffin drop. Now you got three weeks worth of shit. This fucking Darby Allen can't get a hold of this fucking Starks. When's he going to be able to get even with this fucking Starks? Three weeks of shit. Instead of one night, you did all three weeks worth, and what's next week? When are you going to hit him with a fucking hand grenade? Pull the pin, shove it up his ass. See what I mean? Too much. Too much. Well, that's the story of AEW, too much. One other thing I'll say about this before we move on, because we've got to end this at some point. That's what I kept saying. I really like Ricky Starks. Showed a ton of charisma with that promo, and uh, he's really impressed me so far in AEW. Next up was Sammy Guevara out with his written signs apologizing in quotation marks to Matt Hardy for what he did and being a smart ass. But then suddenly, and this was a cute little deal, he's switching the signs and suddenly the writing changes and it's like Sammy's a fucking idiot. Sammy's fixed to get his ass kicked. It was, Hardy had interfered with the fucking cards. Okay, it's stupid, but it, it's a tickle. But then here comes Hardy out and hammers him with a chair and beats the shit out of him. This is what I'm talking about. Beat the shit out of him forever. Nobody came out to help. No officials. He throws him off the stage through the timekeeper's table. He's going to impale him with a goddamn hoist him on his own petard. Whatever the fuck. Finally, all the referees come out at the same time to stop him from using a chair again. I, 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 I don't know. I don't, I just, 
Yes, you want Matt to try to get even, but Mal, he's just goddamn just beat this guy into fucking powder. Can anybody just get you get a taste on TV for fuck's sake? Anyway, uh, I won't even ask you to give your thoughts on that. I Thunder Rosa, the NWA women's champion, did a promo. She's a good promo and she speaks Spanish too. I saw her. She actually she lays her shit in. She's not that big, but she's stiff. She does some good shit. Maybe they're actually trying to get some accomplished women on this program. Between her and Darby and Ricky Starks, three people on the same show with the half face face paint. Well, that is, that is a little, yeah, that is a little uh, excessive. Uh, but, uh, well, Ricky ain't going to do it, but just the once. I know. And then <laughs> they go to the shot of the announcers and Veda Scott has joined the announce team. They got four people now. I know Veda Scott. She's a nice girl. We tried to get her. When Sinclair first bought Ring of Honor, me and Hunter Johnston, Delirious, the booker, were going absolutely out of our fucking minds because while we were trying to book the live events, write the TV formats, come up with things to, with the guys, etc., they constantly wanted us to do spreadsheets spreadsheets for the travel people we, we couldn't even have the travel people we wanted we had to go through the sinclair travel agent i've mentioned this before well i wasn't going to do a spreadsheet because we weren't none of us were going to live long enough and delirious tried hard but it was taking up all of his fucking time doing these spreadsheets on the travel and all this other shit they wanted from the office veda scott was in law school it was like eight, nine years ago. We said, she's brilliant. She can do all the computer shit. We said, Joe, we have to book this thing. We have to write the TV. Give Veda Scott 75 bucks a week, and she will do the spreadsheet so that they're right, and we don't have to worry about it. We couldn't get her 75 bucks a week. He's like, well, when she, when she gets out of school, maybe we could hire her full time. I said, we may not be still alive when she gets out of school. We're going to have a fucking heart attack. Just give her 75 bucks a week to do the stooge work. It's the wrestling business. We don't do spreadsheets. We book fucking people with goddamn book learning from fucking schools. There's a million of those. They can do the spreadsheets. You've only got five living bookers left, right? Well, apparently anyway. she's been the commentator on the YouTube women's tag team tournament show. Well, that's good, because that's why they, they had her there for the Women's Tag Team Tournament Finals. Brandy and Bunny with Dustin and QT. Why are they out there against Ivelisse and Diamante? Ivelisse. Ivelisse, but it's spelled with an I. And Dustin was starting to make Brandy's action figures wrestle with each other. And I fast forward it. Why, I will ask this. The Women's Tag Team Tournament, they announced it. They had it on YouTube. And then the finals are on this program. Did we see a package? Did I skip through a package? Or did they just announce, well, here's the finals. Or did we see a package of the other parts of the tournament? If they did a package, I missed it too. I know. I mean, I'm. I'm not I, here. Here's Jim Cornette asking for more girl wrestling on television. But if you're going to do something, at least show us the road to the finals. If they did it, I didn't see it, too. I know yeah. for dark, they have the results at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, it's, I don't I don't know what they've done. About if you've had a tournament, do a package. But anyway, I, I fast forwarded 10 fucking minutes and I saw some indie level girl shit and the heels won one, two, three. There you go. Let's get to the to the main event of this massacre. Now the question has been answered. Why? Why? Why did Cody go 20 minutes with Whorehouse and Jelly and all the rest of these schlubs? Because he can't whip anybody. <laughs> That's why they've proven it now. What the what, what was this? I don't know. This was so wrong on so many levels. Yes, if Cody, and we've been talking about this, if Cody had been dominant over all of these middle card schlubs and outlaw guys that they'd brought in, this would have been shocking. But since guys half his size have taken him 20 minutes, it wasn't that shocking. 
if any other heel in the business in any company was given this push, even Lance Archer in their own company, instead of the most boring big man in the history of wrestling, he would have gotten over. But you can't get boring Brody over. It's not going to fucking happen. And everybody's going to say, oh, he looked great. He looked great. Yes, he did. If this was the only time I'd ever seen Brody Lee, I would think he was fucking great. Because he did all of his shit the way he wanted to a willing opponent that could take it and had to sell nothing. You can't do this all the time. If this conversely was the first time I'd seen Cody, I'd say, what the fuck? This guy's a champion of what? I, st- I Brody Lee still can't talk. He proved that at the end of the show. He's still going to have to have a fucking match with somebody. Most people aren't going to be as good as Cody, and he's not going to be allowed to just steamroller everybody. If he is, they're going to have a bunch of fucking dead talent at the end of it. So they put this much time and effort. It's at this point, it's just to to not to prove everybody wrong because there's no proof here. It's to say fuck you to everybody that says from the start that the dork order is a goddamn bullshit bunch of idiots and that we made a huge mistake with Brody Lee because he's a boring fucking nothing happening, non-personality fucking big schlub. So since all those things have been obvious for the past nine months, we're going to deny them and push this thing harder. Is that what you got out of this? I certainly think they're doubling down on the dark order big time. And that isn't necessarily what I would be doing. Hey, and we've, we've put over in the past. How I always think Cody's matches are the, the best put together. They make the most sense. They're the most logical. They're the most dramatic. They're the most like pro wrestling. His match with Dustin was an epic. One of the greatest matches from anywhere that I've seen in the past several years. Well, maybe you're giving Cody too much credit for that match. Well, well, it's the same time. You just said Dustin looks like a million dollars every time I see him. But Cody, I think what it is, is Cody is trying to book like Dusty, but he doesn't have access to the talent Dusty had access to. And he's not as good at picking it because and anybody. He's not a, and he's not as good at, at booking as Dusty was at his well, best. No. Well, no. And it's not fair to, you know, think that anybody should be. He's booking like Dusty but, Rhodes 1988. Well, yeah, it's true. And Dusty had already been booking for fucking 10 or 12 years before that. But it I just, this didn't make anybody who, it's, you've got to pick, not only do the right things, but you got to pick the right talent. And I'm sorry. I apologize to anybody that thinks that Brody Lee's ever going to get over. I'm sorry. I apologize in having to tell you that, no, it's not going to fucking happen. This not, guy is never going to be a major wrestling star in any other company but this one and so it was just a a, a a slaughter are they switching cody heel is he going to be upset about this are they going to try to explain it like it's a mental thing and and he's going to blow off arn i don't fucking know i'm sure there's a goddamn soap opera behind this did you ever see rocky but- three uh, yes, I did. I saw all the Rockies. Well, that was what I was thinking here, where Rocky got overconfident, got in there with Mr. T, a young, hungry guy, destroyed Rocky. Rocky's manager has a heart attack and dies. Well, if I, if Arne, Rocky has stay to home. Rocky has to reinvent himself. He's gotten too cocky. He's resting on his laurels. He needs to pick himself up, train with someone new, and then get his big rematch. Okay, and that... You know, okay, that might even be okay to get to rehabilitate Cody out of this, but it's just such a crime to give somebody a push like this and a match like that with a guy that is over for that viewing audience, it's set like Cody, etc., and it'd be Brody fucking Lee. Just a waste. Just a waste. So anyway, in case anybody doesn't know, Brody Lee just opened up. uh, Well, they opened up fighting and Cody opened up hot and Brody stopped him and just beat the piss out of him and beat him flat. One, two, three. Flat as a plate full of piss. And then as he beat him and was standing there and brought all the dork order in, 
they went further with it and they took Cody out on a stretcher. JR forgot where he was and said to, to a medical facility. Here is where, did you notice, they did the ambulance bit right, or at least the you didn't see the ambulance, but the stretcher. They had a real doctor. They took the time. It was real reactions. It was things you would legitimately do, putting somebody on a stretcher and wheeling them out of there. This was done perfectly. The most well-done stretcher bit, realistic and not bullshit, of course, except for the fact that people take stuff in every match now that looks way worse than what happened to Cody, but accepting that, perfect fucking stretcher job, and then, and then the fucking heels attack Arn gently, because Arn has the bad neck, and, and nobody wants to be responsible for hurting Arn, so they did what they could do with Arn physically, and then they fucking bring Cody out and turn the stretcher over and dump him off on the stage, and then they drag Dustin and QT Marshall out too. Guess who we're missing? Brandy had to come out on her own to cover her husband, and then they have the dork order girl choke her out. If there was a crowd there, that would have gotten the biggest pop of the night. Yes, they, they would have turned them babyface. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as Anna J put her in the chokehold, the place would have gone nuts. Absolutely berserk. But they went to these links. If they had talent, if they had a legitimate talent group or a, a squad or a team or a faction or whatever they're calling them these days, if they had two or three or four legitimate talents in a group and they did this it would be a memorable angle. It would be something people would talk about. They did all the right things to get heels over, except have heels that can get over. This fucking jack-off-looking group of job guys and minute, tiny, fucking interchangeable white kids in black masks with this black hole of charisma as a leader this was all wasted because of who it was done with. And then wh while they were hooking Dustin up in the, or Dustin, Cody up in the, on the stretcher, Brody Lee had all the time in the world to cut a fucking promo. And what he did was he brought us back to reality. Unfocused, killing time, stopping and starting, bland yelling with no fucking... He repeated could, himself. He did. He, re he, he repeated himself and, and hardly said anything and repeated it anyway. You're exactly right. Can you imagine if that had been 1986 and that had been Dusty laying there instead of Cody and that was one of the horsemen? They wouldn't have fucking shut up until Cody was almost in the fucking ambulance and they were like, oh shit, I got to go turn him over. They would have taken it. I would have taken advantage of the fucking time. I would have told everybody in the goddamn world what they could do and how to do it and how many times to spin on top of it before they shoved it all the way in. This fucking big goof is walking around trying to think of something to say. But Dusty would have been attacked by the horseman, not by Paul Jones's army. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You did all this shit to get somebody over and you picked probably the the only people that it was completely impossible to get over. Even in this company, there'd be a way to get almost anybody over except for jelly and fucking, you know, a few of the, the fucking lesser lights. But <sighs> all that work. And then if you do it again in the next year, something this heavy or laying everybody out like that, people just go, oh, they, they've already done that. So you've, You've lost your chance to make a first impression with talent that can register with this fucking guy and this fucking group and this fucking goofiness. So there's, ah, ah, that show started. You know what? Hold on. I'm not tearing them today. Why not? Uh, is that a lighter? God damn it. You I need stop. You're going to accidentally burn something in your office. It, Cut it, it out. It, it won't strike. It, Jimmy, it won't strike. It won't strike. If only we had a fire starting sponsor right now. It would be perfect. I can't get the fucking... I need more lighter fluid. Uh, 
<laughs> you know what that was from Jimmy. It won't strike. I've told you that story. Well, no, what is that? The Iron Sheik. Oh, oh, that's right. in in Evansville was supposed to burn Lawler. Was supposed to throw the fireball at him, and they'd already cut the promos for the following week. Whenever come back, where Lawler talked about the way you burned my face last Wednesday night, right? They got all the heels are holding Lawler, and Jimmy Hart's like, "Burn him, burn him!" And Sheik has the the fucking lighter got wet. He's like, "Jimmy, it wants to strike. It wants to strike." So they couldn't do the fucking fireball. So he basically fucking just stuck the bic in Lawler's face and like struck it several times and Lawler sold like he was being burned in individual places. This show, it won't strike, Jimmy. It won't strike. What'd you think of that last one? I thought that was the highlight of the show, quite frankly. I agree with you. Brody Lee has not shown me really much of anything since he's been in AEW. He looked good here because he got to do all his shit to somebody that could take it. But otherwise, than that, fuck, I could have done that. I got to be honest. You know, you and I disagree about Cody and Cody's abilities in the ring and what he brings to the table. You I'm I- starting to lean over to your side of the fence. <laughs> well, well, we'll see about that. But I thought this was really good. It was impactful. What? I what? thought it was good and impactful because... Look, I, I disagree with pushing the dark order. I get you're going to because the Young Bucks created it. And I don't like the dark order. I think the dark order is garbage. I think having Brody Lee with a sea of jobbers is a bad idea other than Anna J. <laughs> but I thought this was an impactful angle. We'll see where they go with it. They destroyed the Nightmare family. By the way, just point here, too many fucking factions in AEW. Everyone doesn't have to be in a faction. And we've said this before. Remember when there was only one faction? That's why it stood out and was unusual. I th- There's look, only one faction in a fucking... That's why the babyface had, had to have to band together to fight the heel faction. Despite the fact that I'm not a fan of the Dark Order, I thought this was really well done for what it was. I think maybe this could be something that makes Cody interesting again, because despite the fact he's been the TNT champion and having these long extended matches with every indie guy he could find, and then a very short match with Scorpio Sky, the most talented of all those guys that he wrestled, (laughs) which still makes no sense. Should have dropped it to Scorpio Sky, to be honest with you. But maybe this will make him interesting again. We haven't heard any promos from him in weeks. Now this gives him something to talk about. We'll see where they go with Arn. If this leads to Brandy versus Anna Jay, that's a problem. You fast-forwarded that women's tag match. I didn't. Brandy Rhodes should not be in a ring. She should not be in a ring. We're not even talking about the idea. You watched she... it? You I watched, watched it. I watched it. Well, tell us about it. There's nothing to tell. It sucked. <laughs> they didn't need a, t- a women's tag team division. They have enough problems with their wingle, the, the wingle, with their women's <laughs> singles division. The wingle division. The wingle division sucks. But Brandy shouldn't be in the ring. Brandy, for a wrestler, she shouldn't be in a ring. She's not a wrestler. She's not a wrestler. But that's not going to happen. She's going to be on every single week. Well, but the point is, you thought it was a, a good angle. And I get, and actually, we're agreeing with each other again, to the consternation of no. all the listeners out there. We're agreeing with each other. This was so well done and so at such a great angle and a heat angle and impactful that that's why my head exploded that they would do something. They finally do something well, even the ambulance or the, the stretcher ride thing. They even did that right after we've been bitching and complaining. They do everything right with the exact wrong heel group to do something like that with that you will get nothing out of. So they have demolished their nightmare family for no good purpose. No, I thought uh, it would... other, other talented heels could have gotten over in that situation. I agree. I mean, what would be more impactful, this or if Lance Archer destroyed Cody and then destroyed every one of them while Jake laughed? That would have been more impactful. Yeah. I'm not a fan of Brody Lee in AEW. I thought he looked really good here. But we found out also from our little bird that Brody Lee is apparently best friends with the guy that works for AEW that's friends with Meltzer because he got him the job in the office. So there you go. Yeah, but that doesn't say everyone there is friends. It's, it's a f- company <laughs> of friends. It's a very that's happy why, place to work. That's why they all hug and kiss and shake hands and pat each other on the back and the butt after they have their matches where they hate each other. 
I don't, there's nothing else to say. I don't, I, there's nothing else to say. Well, this is your fucking show. Close it up. We're not playing any songs this week as a punishment. Yeah. We're punishing ourselves because we had to watch these fucking shows. And I didn't even watch SmackDown. Yeah, we'll see how I feel. And this this week on The Experience, we're going to talk about SummerSlam in the Thunderdome. Oh, boy. And I, all I know is we don't get to see any bald-headed girls. And that just pisses me off. Well, well, we'll see what else is on SummerSlam. Neither one of us have watched it yet, and I've avoided spoilers or anything, but the Jim Cornette... Ex- I can't even fucking speak. <laughs> the Jim Cornette Experience, Friday, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Unless Jim calls me on Thursday and says, I didn't watch this yet. I need another day. <laughs> no, I've, I've got all week. I can't, can't slip out of it. The Jim Cornette Experience on Friday. Don't forget, you can hear classic episodes of the drive through Any Experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornette. $5 a month gets you in the door. Every episode up till March of 2015 is up right now with new episodes added each and every Sunday evening. Check it's it not today. even it's not even a penny an hour now. It's multiple hours for a penny. All the content up there. No, but if you think we're driven crazy by Brody Lee, you should hear what the listeners are saying about Alice right now. The people who yeah, listen yeah. during that initial run. Patreon.com slash Cornette. At least Alice doesn't live here anymore. Imagine if she was the exalted one. That would have been something. But anyway. Hey, what? Tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube for the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Over 155,000 subscribers with more each and every week. We continue our march to a million subscribers. Be one of them today. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. Check Help. out. Help. Be three or four of them if you want to. We don't care. No, we want it done the official way. Check out the All right. check out the amazing Travis Heckle artwork while you're there. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast, where we don't talk about AEW at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Don't forget Cornette's Collectibles, JimCornette.com. See what's going on over there. I'm plugging nothing else. And uh, you have anything else to say? You have any goodbye thoughts? I I have no other statements to make at this time. I refer you to my attorney, Stephen P. New. The show is sponsored by the law office of Stephen P. New. A man we need right about now. 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until Friday on The Experience, where we review SummerSlam, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho. Hey.